You ready? Okay, I'm going to call to order. Um, today is Monday, February 4th, Budget and Finance Committee uh, meeting. If there isn't any objections, we'd like to move BL 2018 1442, BL on third reading, to the top of the agenda. Is there any objections? The bill is um, um, the Nashville Yards Agreement, uh, Councilman Glover. Councilman Glover. So you want to hold? Uh, you want to? You want us to wait for everything else until we get this? And I'm assuming, Chair, that we're going to wait until uh, we can have a perhaps a uh, longer conversation about a particular bill. Is that the reason? The rationale behind it is because we've had two weeks uh, for council members to get their, their questions. There were many concerns from the prior committee meeting as it relates uh, to this particular ordinance. So in, in running an efficient meeting today, we have a heavy agenda. Um, that's my request to move it to the top of the agenda. Okay. Well, we got to well, be here long on the front end and be here long on the back end. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm simply asking, are we moving it because we think it's going to take a while to do yes. this. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Seeing no objections. We'll begin with BL on third reading, BL 2018 1442. As amended, sponsors Vircher, O'Connell, and Betney approves the acquisition property from four parties and approves a participation agreement and license agreement and an easement agreement between Metro and Uptown Property Holdings LLC. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. We do have proposed amendments. Give us a set. We put. We're getting. We're getting ready, Councilman Glover. Be patient. Amendment A is Councilwoman Gilmore. She's not president. I mean, president. She's not present. What's the next amendment, uh, Attorney Jameson? Councilman B. I mean, Amendment B, Councilman Glover. Press your button, Councilman Glover. You're on. We're on Amendment B, Councilman Glover. Okay, Mr. Jameson, if you wouldn't mind, please explain what my amendment does to this uh, with regards to the, the bill as a whole. And let me say, if I may, before you speak, that I'm not in, in opposition of supporting business coming to Nashville. I am in opposition if we put uh, business ahead of the right things we should do in our budget. So if you if you wouldn't mind, I would appreciate your explanation, please. Sure. As the council recalls, this previous summer, the council essentially had to rescind the previous payment plans um, enacted through three previous resolutions, uh, the most significant provision of which um, essentially served to deny uh, COLA payments for metropolitan government employees. This amendment would preclude any payments through the participation agreement to uptown property holders uh, unless and until in fiscal year 20 the payment plan in those previously rescinded resolutions uh, reinstates the COLA for fiscal year 2020. So I want to ask you this question if I may Mr. Jameson. The people who did not get their cost of living adjustments this past year <clears throat> perhaps may not get it this coming year. Uh, and we always talk about when this would actually kick in for their benefit on the Nashville Yards piece of it. Uh, when, give me an idea of when that actually kicks in for the benefits for the project that is, has been proposed. Well, I'm, I may defer to Mr. Wilshire to give more specific. And that's specific. fine. Mr. Wilshire, can you give us the timeline? And then, Councilman, we're going to want to take the vote on your amendment. Looks like we have some discussion. Well, I would like well. to have to make sure we have a discussion. Councilman Thank Glover. You. Councilman Wilshire. Mr. Wilshire. Uh, yes, 
So uh, there is a, uh, a, a bit of the infrastructure work that is already uh, being worked on now. And so um, it, this, the, the structure of participation agreements, the funds for this that are a question for this participation agreement were appropriated, maybe the right word, approved in the capital spending plan in October. And so as that work, uh, initial amount of the work is completed, uh, then those reimbursements would be eligible if this bill uh, participation agreement were approved. So that could happen. Um, I would maybe defer to someone from the development team to give a specific timetable, but I mean, that could happen as soon as this summer uh, for, for the initial piece of that. And then as uh, you recall from prior discussions about this, there is an overall commitment in the participation agreement for $15.25 million, um, only uh, 6.25 million of which has been approved by this body already, and so there would be another $9 million that would come in future capital spending plans, or that would, is proposed to be in future capital spending plans, um, and uh, no more than $6 million of which could come in any one capital spending plan. And so those amounts would only become available when those future capital spending plans were approved, if they were approved in the future. So, Attorney Bohm, would you come and provide the timeline? I know council members received it in a summary, but just so we can have it on record for the view and audience. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you, Chair. Um, so I think there's a couple of pieces to that answer. The first is the $80 million or the $79.4 million of the total infrastructure is underway. Um, as of the end of the year, about $25 million of that had already been completed. I would suspect we're now closer to $30 million on that. And then the infrastructure piece of this, that's the work, quote unquote, that Metro is reimbursing for, the $15.25 million, is actually ahead of that and going faster. Uh, so all of that is on a, a pretty accelerated, expedited pass, uh, path. However, the reimbursements for that will not come for over uh, up to a four-year period, as Mr. Wilshire explained. Okay, so Chair, here's my final question. And this is to the administration. And if they, and it's a yes or no answer. Last year, when we did not honor the cost of living adjustments and we opted for other things, do they believe this is absolutely the right thing to do and not honor those raises that we promised? That's a simple yes or no. Thank you. What is it? Question is a capital spending amount. This is not operating. So, so operating dollars are different from capital spending dollars. I, so I, I think I know to, that. Yes. But I, I mean, I just I, I want to make sure that the the viewing public understands that these are from two different buckets. One is the annual operating amount. The other is the capital amount. But the short answer to your question is yes. We believe approving this participation agreement, generating significant tax dollars into the future to help fund things like employee salaries, is exactly the right thing for the future of this city. So Chair, yes, yes is the answer to your question. All right, Chair, Councilman. forgive me. So I get the fact that we're saying it's capital versus operating. I get it. But I think the public also needs to understand that we pay these loans back out of the operating budget. So I think everybody needs to understand exactly what we're playing with. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Glover. We do have, looks like, a lot of discussion relating to your amendment. We are on discussion for Amendment B. Councilwoman, uh, Councilwoman Weiner. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate your time. Essentially, although we are using operating funds to pay back a capital debt, we have to find a diversified revenue stream in order to fund that. And if we want to do things like pay our employees the raises that we promised several years ago and support all of the other things that we need to do to run Metro government, we clearly need to find every opportunity to A, mitigate our expenses, which is being done through the infrastructure work that's all being, already being done, that is part of this opportunity for us that is going to reduce our expense because if we weren't doing it this way, our expense would be at least double what it is now. So that's number one. Number two, if we want to get more property tax value from this property that has not been giving us the property taxes that we can get, then developing the property appropriately is what we need to do. And certainly I think 
you know, in business, you have to spend a little money to make money, and that's exactly what we're doing because we have a multifold return on this investment, not only fiscally through reduction of our expenses and increasing our revenues, but by also creating jobs, and that's our job. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Wiener. Councilman Mendez. Uh, thanks. I was about to unpress my button because uh, Councilman Wiener just covered my points. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Mendez. We are on um, Amendment B, seeing no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, we're going to need show of hands. We're voting on Amendment B. All in favor? All opposed? One, two, three, four, Raise them high, Councilwoman Dow. One, two, three, four, five, six, and we're going to say fails. Amendment, amendment fails. B. B. Amendment B fails. Councilmember Gilmore. Councilmember Gilmore, amendment, you're going to go back to Amendment A. We're going to go back to Amendment A. Attorney Jameson, will you advise the committee? Yes. as to what this uh, amendment is? Yes, Council Lady Gilmore's amendment labeled Amendment A because there are multiple amendments to this ordinance <clears throat> um, would essentially attempt to apply the previous procurement policy uh, enacted uh, by this council um, a few months ago with respect to Chapter 4.46, uh, the Equal Business Opportunity Program. With respect to um, that chapter, that applies to uh, vendors doing business directly with the metropolitan government. So its ability to apply in this instance where Nashville Yards would be um, essentially uh, letting the contracts themselves, uh, state law does not allow immediate and direct participation. So similar to the occasional zoning ordinance where a developer will wish to provide property uh, or some sort of gift to um, metropolitan government, uh, we can accept those gifts, but we have to make clear in the underlying legislation that it is not a condition and that the developer is doing so voluntarily. This applies that approach and simply states that Nashville Yards would voluntarily apply to the extent it can the terms of the Equal Business Opportunity Program and its implementation of the participation agreement. That is Section A. Section B would state, um, in previous discussion, it was uh, indicated uh, on the Public Works Director that um, the department would be using uh, private uh, contractors to oversee and manage these properties, uh, or this participation agreement uh, deployment. So to the extent uh, the metropolitan government engages outside private contracting parties for that purpose, uh, section B of this amendment would specify that the Equal Business Opportunity Program shall apply to those contractors in that instance. Councilwoman Weiner. I just have one question, Mike. Uh, to your point, and I understand the rationale behind this, um, I'm more thinking in terms of state law. By putting this in resolution format, is that not making this a directive by the Metro Council that would be in violation of state law? So what we've done in the past, the, the state law is the Tennessee Contractors Licensing Act, which provides what conditions can apply in, in procurement instances and makes clear that uh, no other conditions can be mandated by a municipality or other governmental entity. So this uh, portion of the amendment makes clear that this is purely voluntary compliance by Nashville Yards and is not to be deemed a condition of the execution of the participation agreement in an attempt to avoid that very issue. So my next question, Chair, would be, has anybody discussed this with Nashville Yards and what has their response been? And if possible, could we hear from them? I have to yield to, to, the, to the sponsor first and then we can call up representatives okay. from okay. Nashville Yards. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Weiner. Yeah, okay. this, Councilwoman Gilmore. We're on Amendment A. Thank you. Um, so I have not spoken directly to them, but I have spoken to the representatives, uh, which I think is Beecher. And he told me that they were uh, open to this idea, but I do look forward to hearing more from Ms. Charles, Charles Robert Bone back there. So I have been in conversations, but to speak directly with the persons from Nashville Yards, 
No, I haven't. And then I have some follow-up questions after we hear from uh, Mr. Charles Robert Bone. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Gilmore. Attorney Robert Bone. Sure. So, uh, Council Lady, certainly we appreciate um, what is intended here. I think the the issues we have are a couple fold, and let me lay those out and then tell you where I think we're we're headed. Um, T taking away the legal analysis and what's required by the act, uh, this is work that's well underway that also has been contracted for, and the EBO program, as I understand it, doesn't take effect and won't have the rules and regulations till sometime uh, later this summer. So what, I, what the Nashville Yards folks attempted to do and laid out in the letter that I believe was distributed to you on Friday was to say, despite that, uh, they are under contract already for $10.7 million worth of, of, of DBE work as it relates to the early infrastructure work and parcel one, and to make the commitment in that letter, which I would argue has the same legal standing as voluntarily uh, as to what's in the amendment, uh, would to say that certainly they would exceed the participation amount of Metro. I think they will do, obviously, uh, far better than that uh, across that site but we're trying to recognize the fact that this is not a program in place uh, currently, that the work was underway, but also to recognize what they've already done to date. Councilwoman Gilmore. Thank you. So I would like to hear from someone from the mayor's office, and I know that someone had called earlier, but I just was not able to uh, get my phone. If you could just explain in more detail when we expect, expect for it to take effect, and then how in the future um, I guess the first question is when we can expect for this to take effect because it was um, passed unanimously. And then the second piece is if we continue to contract out, how can we close that loophole? Because I know that a lot of business owners and people that helped to rally around the council members and the mayor were under the expectation that when we do business as a city, and I'm clear about the contracting piece, but if there's any money that's citizens' money that we're using or allowing private developers to use that they would be able to participate in this. So how can we close that loophole when we do contracts out? Because if we continue to contract out, then it won't apply to anyone. So I would like to hear when will it take effect and is it, is it a fair question or not? If we're using citizens' money, will we continue to contract out or will we try to close this loophole now that we see, if we allow others to contract out, that those rules do not apply. Sure, council member, um, thank you. Uh, so I, I don't think that we thought of this as a loophole. We, we um, at least when we were putting forward the, and working with you and others to put forward the equal business opportunity legislation, um, that it would apply simply to Metro procurement for a variety of reasons, some of which um, Council Jamison addressed, that it's difficult for us to mandate to the private sector. However, your point is a good one, and I certainly, I mean, we think this is amazing legislation. We think it's good for the city. We think it's good to support a diversity of suppliers and to have more businesses participate in more city. More cities. And the mayor, when he announced the legislation, I think said that he hopes that we're setting an example for the private sector. So to your point, um, I think we, I, I don't, I, I don't want to speak too much, but, but we, and Michelle Lane may want to speak to this as well, but I mean, I think we absolutely want to look at ways to have more people follow these rules, whether it's voluntary or, uh, and, and for consideration with this body, or um, if there's some way to sort of mandate it, we can absolutely look into that. But we, we think the legislation's a good thing for the city, and we think that others ought to follow by it as well. And we worked with the developers in this case who have committed voluntarily to do at least $15.25 million of contracting with women-owned and minority-owned businesses as they build out this site, and we think that's a good thing and sort of sets the example for why we think legislation like this is the city being a partner is a good thing, because it gives us some leverage with the private sector to do things that, that we think that is good for them anyway and is certainly good for the city. So I'm not sure I exactly answered your question, um, but I, I mean, I'll tell you, I, I mean, we are interested in advancing this as well, and we'll work with you to figure out on, f I mean, I think for future deals, how we set the standard so that people know in advance what they're 
expectations are before they come to the table is the thing. So I guess the, the, the fundamental question is when does the program begin? Oh, Th that I'm was sorry. like a. I'm sorry, I didn't answer, I should have answered yeah. that first. So under the statute that was passed, it doesn't begin for 180 days from passage. So, so, so it doesn't, I mean, because it, it takes time to work through the procurement process, their outstanding procurement. So 180 days from passage, which I think was the second meeting in January, so roughly the middle of July, is when the new standards will be in place. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. I just wanted to get that piece out. And then the second part is, I wasn't clear to Attorney Bones' point, is it the nine million has already been spent or is it because the contracts are already out there that they cannot commit and they can only commit going forward? I just need more clarity on that. We'll let Attorney Bone um, address right. that. And I know council members, you, you received a summary as well, but Attorney Bone, just again for the for the viewing audience. Sure, the $10.7 million is what is either has been spent or is under contract currently to be spent uh, with those vendors on the DBE piece of that. So it's work that has already been let. Okay, I got it. So yeah, I, I do look forward uh, to it. And is that uh, 10.7? Seven million is that tied to the sidewalks or is it not tied? Is that just money in general that has it, been spent? It's, re it's it, the 10.7 relates to the early part of the infrastructure work as well as some of the work to the, the parcel one, which is the first parcel under development. Okay, and so then, Matt, I have a question for you. Where are we as it relates to the part of the public works as it relates to the sidewalks? Where are we with that? Uh, I, I don't, what, what with, the, with the, um, I guess the bill that Cooper M have, they said it was, uh, was originally, I thought we thought it was 15 million, but it's 11.487 million. Where is this money? Where are we on that particular part of, or the phase of that project? Sure. I'm, I don't know if we want to, you want me to address this now or address it, it, it when we get to that amendment? Yeah, um, let's, uh, Councilwoman Gilmore, if we can, if we can hold that and okay. address it, because there's other amendments coming also. Okay, good. Yeah. And the only reason I ask is She's not to take this. She's utility total. Yeah, to, not to take it off task, because this is the part of the city's money that we're reimbursing, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so... I guess the point that I was trying to drive without getting too far off, if we're using a lot of citizens' money, we would want this part of the procurement to apply, right? Yes, and so without getting too far off, just kind of want to make a point there. So when we come back to it, that's the whole point of that. And that's not contractors' money. That's actually citizens' money that we will be re reimbursing them to do the work, correct? Uh, no, no, actually, all of the money is, I mean, it's all Metro money. I guess right. I should say the, the $15.25 is all Metro money coming from two different sources, water revenue bonds and then geo bonds. Okay. Um, but it is, it is being, it, the actual work is being completed, not through Metro procurement, but through the developer directly, and we're reimbursing them for a portion of their costs. Right, and I, I think maybe you articulated it a little bit more specifically than I did, but the point is that it's Metro's. Money. It is metro that's, money. That's what I'm trying to get to the root at. It's not originally the developer's money, and that is the concern in just in terms of the participation. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We're still on discussion on Amendment A. Councilwoman Wiener, were you seeking recognition? Okay. Uh, Councilman Mendez. <laughs> Councilman Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and this is just in long uh, lines with Ms. Gilmore's amendment and her questions that she was just asking. We had heard at a previous meeting about sometimes we have existing contracts with contractors under the city, and we have the ability to say we'll outsource a particular amount of work to someone we already have an existing contract with. So with that procurement legislation, once it kicks in in 180 days, would that apply to that same process also? meaning those existing contracts that we have or companies that we have contracts with, would that procurement legislation apply to those same situations? Attorney Jameson. The way that the ordinance amendment is currently drafted in subsection B, it states that if a private firm is engaged by Metro through a separate agreement, uh, to provide construction uh, or other services for the fulfillment of the participation agreement. So in other words, it anticipates that a non-existing contract is then 
negotiated and effectuated to implement the participation agreement. Then in that case, when we have a clear starting point, then the, equal, the EBO requirements would apply. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Hall. Councilman Mendez, are we sure? Thanks, I'm sorry. Um, so I, I, maybe this is for um, Mr. Bone. Uh, so am I hearing that uh, as drafted, Nashville Yards is um, not in favor and, and not volunteering to do what's listed in the amendment because it's not practical and it, it uh, is committing to what you described verbally? Is, is that what I understand? So let me be clear about one thing. Obviously, we're committed to, to DBE participation on this project, number one. Number two is just the legal issue around both it's asking us to voluntarily, I think we've still got some conf confusion around that and whether it's enforceable, to comply with a program that doesn't yet exist today and may not exist for another five and a half or six months. What we have tried to be clear about is we are absolutely going to do an equivalent amount of DBE spending on this project to equal Metro's reimbursement, and we've already done or under contract for two-thirds of that. And so we thought, obviously, what was provided to you all uh, in that correspondence actually went a step further in many regards as to what's in this ordinance, since this is a program that doesn't currently exist. Uh, thank you. Let me ask uh, Legal Director Cooper something. Um, the bill we have before us, um, is, is this a situation where um, if we approved it, uh, that the city and National Yards would be able to um, put an addendum on the participation agreement where they outlined what they were going to do voluntarily, or would we have to um, get language like that approved before the, um, we pass the legislation? Like, I seem to remember other uh, contracts, uh, uh, non-substantive um, things can get added to the contract without our approval, and it seems like having a description of what the voluntary performance is um, would be non-substantive. So if, if the legislation itself says that the contract is being approved in form and that future uh, non-substantive amendments can be approved, um, you know, just by the, by the administration, um, I'm not sure if that's in this legislation or not, but that's, that's typically how that's done. Um, Madam Chair, will you bear with me one minute? So the, um, the legislation as drafted says the mayor or his designee is further authorized to execute such documents as are customary and necessary to carry out the intent of this ordinance. Do you think that would allow the parties to stick a non-binding voluntary commitment from National Yards on, on the participation agreement? Ms. Mr. Attorney Cooper? Ms. Yes. Mr. Bone, do you think that would work for National Yards? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Mendez. Councilman Glover. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I need to ask a really important question for me, for my district. So I met with the mayor, uh, I don't know, right after he got elected. And he and I had a conversation. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to speak on his behalf. I remember the conversation, and so I'm not going to go into the conversation. I would like to know, when was the last time the mayor's office reached out to me to talk about this and the money that you're going to ask my people, my, the people who elect me? When was the last time that we had a Councilman Glover, do you have a question related to the That's it, right amendment there, a. because I believe... Councilman Glover, we're on discussion for Amendment A. So, Framing question. in the question for discussion for Amendment A, Councilman Glover. And we are where we are. My question is, these things are out there. And if we're going to keep glossing over things, that's fine. My question is, when is the last time the mayor's office had a conversation with me? I'm sorry I'm such an inconvenience. Thank you. Councilwoman Allen. I want to return to the suggestion that Councilmember Mendez 
made and, and just ask for one more clarification from Mr. Bone. Attorney Bone. So in your in your letter, you had stated that y'all would be um, would be willing to provide 15 point whatever the amount that you're being reimbursed in um, DBE participation and that you've already done 10 million of that in the and, and he was talking legal. So I don't totally get what he suggested, but it sounded like it worked. Would you be comfortable putting that amount? Yeah, ab absolutely. I, th I think what Councilman Mendez referred to it as a non-binding, voluntary kind of detail of, of what it is or a summary of what it is that we're doing. And th there's no issue with attaching that to the agreement. Attaching it to the agreement. Yes, ma'am. And then I guess can some mathematician, and does that end up being roughly the same type of percentage that this uh, program that we that will will have in the future? Well, as so as I understand it, I mean, what we're trying to get to is a, an equivalent amount here because part of the difficulties with saying that we're going to apply to this this program that doesn't yet exist. My understanding is that some of those percentages and some of those amounts would be set on a project by project basis that look into capacity, uh, the amount of work, et cetera. Right. So I, I just think with with all due respect to the amendment i just don't think we're there yet so what we tried to say was hey listen here's what we know we can do which, which ought to be um uh, acceptable under the circumstances and it's essentially the full sum of what metro is re so it's the full sum of the of the the taxpayers money that's that's going into this is, that's, is that's all going to dbe is that correct that's correct that that seems like a good solution to me i appreciate council member mendez figuring out what to call it so we could agree on something thank you councilwoman thank you. allen attorney bone that is 15.2 million 15.25. 15.25, I stand corrected. Thank you so much. And that, that would assume, maybe I should say, instead of 15.25, whatever the reimbursement amount is. I know there's another amendment to take up, but obviously those would work hand in hand. Thank you, Attorney. Councilwoman Allen, will you seek an additional recognition? Okay. okay, we are on Amendment A. C Councilwoman Gilmore. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Vercher. My question is for uh, Mr. Jamison. So at this point, um, I, I think just with a brief explanation, the, the idea is to stay in front of the ball. That's the whole goal. We don't want to wait till legislation passes, and then after 180 days, there's been nothing that we've thought of when we had the opportunity to ask. So that's the whole goal. So am I able to um, make an amendment and suspend the rules so I can do, I guess, an addendum that they discussed so that we can have it. So I understand what he's saying, if there's nothing in place, but we don't want to wait. I feel like we, we find ourselves in this position, we wait and then it's already passed. So I would like to stay in front of it. I understand what he's saying legally, but what from what is written here is my understanding, what I hear you're saying is that we're not binding them legally, we're just asking. And so with that, I, I would like to continue to ask, right? Because it was passed unanimous, unanimously and I do want us to stay in front of the ball. It was an oversight. Um, I think it was some things we didn't foresee. I feel like we have a really good program, but I would like for the intentions and the spirit of the bill to hold that. So I would like for all the committee members to hear what I'm asking. I would like to make an amendment so we can add the addendum and we can move forward. And I think that would satisfy uh, both parties in good faith. If you could just tell me how to do that process, I would greatly appreciate it. A couple of different ways. What I would suggest is let me prepare a late filed amendment for your submission tomorrow. There's no need for the committee to approve or reject an amendment to the ordinance for it to be considered by the full floor tomorrow. With your permission, I would like to engage Mr. Bone, Ma the mayor's office, Metro Legal, to make sure everyone is uh, comfortable with an addendum to the participation agreement that provides this language. Have the late file agreement for you to offer on the floor tomorrow and request adoption at that point. The late file the, need to the microphone, Councilwoman Gilmore. <clears throat> so, do I need to withdraw this one? Just leave it like it is. I, I would, if I were you, I just, would withdraw this okay. one. Okay, I will do that. Um, with the committee understanding that I'm going to bring back a late file resolution, I would like to uh, move to withdraw the bill. Okay. Thank you, Councilwoman Gilmore. Thank you. Amendment A is withdrawn. Amendment A is withdrawn. And now, Amendment C. Now we're on to Amendment C. Uh, Mr. Jamison, if you can advise the committee and the viewing audience of, of Amendment C, Certainly. and then we will call on the, the sponsor. 
In Exhibit B to the participation agreement, it was a recitation of those infrastructure portions that Metro would be providing reimbursement for, which totaled 16 million, 16.6 million. There was a cap in the participation agreement of 15.25 million that uh, Metro was obligated. This amendment would eliminate from that Exhibit B essentially the streets and sidewalks provisions, the traffic signalization provisions, and the construction management provisions. And by uh, removing those portions, it drops from 16.6 to 11.4 million, and it makes the necessary changes in the body of the ordinance to reflect those changes. Thank you, Mr. Jameson. Councilwoman Henderson. Uh, thank you, Chair Bircher. I would like to move this amendment, please. It's been moved and seconded. I believe we have some discussion on Amendment C. Uh, Councilman Cooper. Chair Bircher. Yes. If I may, may I speak to my Sure, amendment? go ahead. I thank thought you, you were going to do that, but go ahead. Uh, just to follow on uh, what uh, Attorney Jameson has shared, uh, subsequent to our uh, deferral uh, last time in committee and questions that were posed there, uh, we did have additional uh, discussion in uh, budget and finance, uh, or rather in public works committee. Um, that discussion in public works committee speaks to the reduction in project construction management. Um, I asked uh, at last meeting related to that, um, uh, if, if that was uh, necessary and to whom uh, that was directed. I understood at last budget and finance that that um, appropriation in the participation agreement was specific to call your engineering. Uh, Director Sturdivant um, came to the uh, Public Works Committee um, and shared with us at that meeting that he was able to reduce that amount by $800,000 to get that down to $100,000. So the fact that that could be reduced so significantly uh, in one day, um, I think, calls into question uh, its, its need, um, and that is why that is eliminated. Um, additionally, uh, I think uh, the conversation that we had in Public Works Committee, uh, I think, elevated and highlighted our understanding that uh, participation as it relates specifically to the water improvements is a, a smart uh, decision for us to make, and it's important for us to uh, uh, leverage uh, this significant uh, uh, project um, uh, specifically. So um, what I was attempting to do through this amendment, colleagues, is to isolate um, the uh, utility uh, participation and so uh, to that end, uh, I have posed questions uh, to the water department um, and the mayor's administration. And so uh, as of noon today, um, I have additional information related to the utilities section. So I think amendment C is an improvement, but I would tell you all that we could um, improve this uh, even additionally. And so. Uh, Chair Vircher, I, I know that colleagues may have questions, but I also do have questions for the Water Department, uh, for Public Works, and for Mr. Bone, myself, that I would like to be on the record. Uh, Councilwoman Henderson, we're on discussion for your Amendment C. Do you want to go ahead and pose your questions now? Um, sure. Okay. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Um, let's see. If I may first, if somebody from the Water Department, please. Um, and, and Councilwoman Henderson, if we can, um, for Richard. all your questions for water, if we, if you can ask them all at once, and I will. we have a turn. Okay. I will indeed. Thank you. Director Potter. Can we take them one at a time, though? <laughs> um, Director Potter, thank you. Um, I also want to thank uh, Amanda Deaton Moyer and. Uh, uh, Shanna Whitelaw um, as well for uh, helping me uh, parse out all these particular uh, items. Uh, colleagues, you do have on the back of your amendments packet, so amendment C is the last page of your amendments packet, um, and then on the back of amendment C, on the back of the packet is exhibit B. So those are the particular pieces um, that we are uh, discussing at this time. Um, Okay, um, Director Potter, just for, for the record, um, and I know it is somewhat uh, lengthy, so I guess I will just kind of 
uh, indicate some of the things that were responded to me by Ms. Ms. Moyer, and if you could just affirm that those are indeed uh, correct. So colleagues, I had asked specifically what pipes and what streets need to be and will be replaced. Um, and so as it related to water infrastructure, um, water shared that an existing 1893 cast iron six inch pipe in Commerce Street from 10th to 9th will be replaced with an eight inch iron pipe and so on. Existing 1888 cast iron six inch pipe in 9th Avenue from Commerce to Church will be replaced with an eight inch ductile iron pipe. Existing 1959 cast iron six inch pipe in 10th Avenue north from Broadway to north of the YMCA replaced with a new 10 inch ductile iron pipe from Broadway to Charlotte. This connects our 24 inch pipe in Broadway to our 12 inch pipe in Charlotte, which is a big benefit to our system. The previous existing piping configuration stopped short of connecting into Charlotte. Is that uh, accurate as to the replacement of the water infrastructure? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, new piping and connection to the large mains in Broadway and Charlotte um, have allowed you all to abandon two mains, correct? Okay, and now combined system infrastructure, you, uh, the water department shared there's an existing 1900 18 inch vitrified clay pipe in 10th Avenue from Commerce to Church. That will be replaced with new 24 inch or 30 inch ductile iron pipe. An existing 15 inch 1900 vitrified clay pipe in 10th Avenue from Alley 121 to Charlotte will be replaced with 18 inches of PVC and a new 18-inch PVC installed in commerce between 10th Avenue and 9th Avenue uh, will be replaced. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and a new 12-inch PVC in 9th Avenue from Lifeway Plaza to commerce. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so um, I guess what I would like to understand then, additionally, I had asked you all uh, to break out um, the kind of hard infrastructure costs versus uh, the labor or materials and labor. Um, and you all indicated that just for common practice, the estimates and prices were just based on the installed line. So those numbers come together. Um, but uh, can you, my understanding here from the email is that the cost of all the pipes that we have just discussed um, and uh, the labor, as far as the participation uh, that the water department has agreed to, that that is just $3.25 million? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, hang on. My CFO wants to provide some information. The total is going to be more than that, but our participation is 3.25. Okay. So your participation as it relates to water infrastructure replacement is 3.25 million. So in this exhibit B, we have stormwater separation at $4.716 million. We have water line upgrades at $1.975 million. So by my accounting, that combines to be $6.68 million. But if you have agreed to a participation of 3.25 million, that to me looks like a $3.43 million discrepancy. So can you speak to that? Yes, <clears throat> we were can, given that. I'm gonna need you to, can you speak into the microphone? Yes. Come, come closer to the, yeah. Our, our process is that we got the estimate and we normally look at that estimate and we see that it is, what is 6.68? We had a different estimate at the time, but and then we participate at 50%. And we have consistently been that our water would participate at 3.25 percent. Okay. And so, uh, in an email, um, uh, I guess around noon, um, responding back from water, uh, Mr. Wilshire, you were cc'd in, um, but have yet to respond as to uh, that discrepancy and some more of my general questions. Can you speak to that discrepancy? I'm pulling up the email again. Which discrepancy specifically were you asking about? Um, I'm asking about the discrepancy I spoke to uh, just now. Um, and then additionally in um, uh, an email, I believe. This no. is the email from this morning? 
Um, correct. The utility demo. Um, let's see. So, uh, Mr. Snyder uh, responded to me midday, confirming about the 3.25 million. Um, but some addition questions I had um, was regarding the utility demo part of the um, uh, question and why that was combined with traffic control um, and why that amount, uh, you know, traffic control and utility demo are put together in the same bucket at a cost of uh, 1.69 million. I, I can't speak to that specifically, I'm sorry. I presume it's because the utilities need to be removed in order mm -hmm. to put the traffic control system in place, but I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. So who negotiated this participation agreement, Mr. Wilshire? Uh, it was negotiated by a number of people. Um, Were in, you in charge of the negotiation? I was not. Who was in charge of this negotiation? Uh, I, I, do, I don't know the, uh, that's, the- That's not appropriate. Who is in charge of this participation agreement negotiation? I think there were a bunch of different people who were involved from a variety of aspects. There wasn't sort of a formal chain of command. I'm sorry, I can't answer your question. But Councilwoman, so Councilwoman Henderson. It's, so you cannot answer for me what the $1.69 million is or why there's a $3.43 million discrepancy between the Water Department's 50% participation and the exhibit that you have presented to this council so, to affirm. So, Councilwoman, and, yeah. So, so I am super sorry, and I will look. I will. I got this email at at noon today, and I've been in meetings afternoon. I will absolutely look into it and see if I can get the answer to this question. And these are important questions. I, I just don't know. I don't even know the, the question that's being asked in, in detail. And so, I apologize. I don't want to speak out of turn so, without having the answer for Ms. you, Mr. Wilshire. Yes. When we asked all these questions by way of due diligence, and additionally in the Public Works Committee two weeks ago. Is it not incumbent upon you? I mean, whether or not you got an email at 12 or, so, I mean, the, the fact that you are saying that you are not in charge of this and that it was a varying chain of command and you don't know where that number came from, but you want this budget and finance committee today to vote for a participation agreement that is $15 million. So, so I, I, I'm so sorry. I just haven't had a chance to read the email to know that the question you're answering, you're asking, and I will absolutely endeavor to do that. I, I, I just don't know the question that you're asking specifically and what the discrepancy is. In terms of who was responsible, there were folks from the water department, public works, and I don't tell the public works guys how to do utility demo, and so I'm not an expert in that, but but I will take responsibility for it. I, I wasn't actually in charge, but I'm happy to take responsibility, and so if there's a failure, it's my fault, and I am so sorry, and I'll look to get the answer for you. So if I may ask, Director Potter, is the Public Works Department demoing water utilities? Council Lady, um, I'm gonna have to kind of start at the beginning. What you're trying to get us to do is to itemize every single step and if you look at a water construction project as an example trying to delineate who's going to be in charge of digging up the asphalt who's going to be in charge of providing the the stone that backfills the hole when you re when you do infrastructure renewal there is a partnership between public works water to get it accomplished we agreed to a 50% participation in the aggregate of the project. So there is no discrepancy. The 6.4 million is what it costs to do. We're participating at 50% of that for a good reason that I've gone into, I think in great detail, that I feel completely comfortable with. But I'm not gonna be able to stand here and tell you who paid for that traffic cone and who paid for that backfill and who paid for that traffic cop. I can't do that. And no one will be able to do that ever because we deal in percentages of participation, which makes general sense for, I guess, the 100 year life of the assets that we're having built for us. So 
I'm not going to be able to answer your questions when you get that kind of specificity. I'm just not going to be able to. Okay. Well, I do appreciate, though, the level of specificity that you and your department have answered up to this point. Okay? So it is possible, in my view, to get to a certain level of specificity. And as we discussed in Public Works, I recognize that there is a certain amount of nuance, labor, related costs, and so forth. But what we are talking about from kind of hard costs that I think we all concur taxpayers um, would be willing to participate, right, in replacing old water infrastructure and aligning that with the work of this development, um, I, I just think that if we are going to have an agreement like this that is $15 million dollars, that um, we need to be more precise about what it is, is in it. Because when we are not precise about what is in it, then you see what I'm saying? So I, I, I recognize that you know, there will be uh, you know, utility demolition and traffic signalization and all of these sort of things, but I think what I am trying to convey is that I think citizens will recognize the merit of participating in uh, updating our water infrastructure, um, but may not feel like Metro should be paying a developer for all these kind of related ancillary costs. And so, if that number is significant, this council is going to scrutinize it because for far too long, we have just rubber stamped this stuff. And so um, I am appreciating the level of detail that you have um, responded with. And so I want to commend your department, but when I speak to a discrepancy whether or not you think that you can provide that, it is still incumbent upon Mr. Wilshire, if this is negotiated in the mayor's office, to respond to who is responsible for coming up with these numbers and specific, somebody had to do the math. So why aren't the taxpaying citizens privy to all the math? Well, we did. Every single calculation when it came to doing the water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure. So we, we did that. Um, when it comes to a level of participation, at some point, engineering judgment is going to have to come into play. And I'm telling you as a professional engineer and as director of the water department, that the city is benefiting from our participation in this project. And I concur with that. So. Um, Councilwoman Henderson, you have any more questions? You, 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 have dis you have many council members that want to discuss this Amendment C. Okay, I do. I guess my additional question was um, for uh, Mr. Wilshire. Let's see, question number two in this email. Okay. Um, have you already emailed him, Councilwoman Henderson? I have, but... Matt, this is what, for sake of time, to get to other council members um, to, so we can get on, moving on this amendment. May Matt. I ask Mr. Wilshire just to speak to temporary power, please? I, again, I, I am not a, a, a either a public works engineer nor am I a, a water engineer, so I am not sure uh, w the necessity of temporary power um, in this specifically. Um, so that would I, be I can, electrical power. Mr. Bone, can you speak to the need for temporary power and why Metro should pay for temporary power? Sure. So, I mean, I think there are two two questions that you've hit on around that. The first on traffic control and utility demolition. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that is the work that goes in with removing the existing utilities that are there to make way for the new utilities and all the work that has to go around that. The temporary power goes in to, as you take the power that's currently there offline to be able to feed power, whatever, it, it's included in the construction cost. Obviously, 
what my client had tried to do to your questions is both on exhibit A, the 79.4 million, and exhibit B, the 15.25 million, instead of giving you just lump line items that this is what it costs to build back the utilities, the, what they had tried to do was give as much transparency around that as possible. But to your specific question, the temporary is utilities that are being built in order to take the old power offline and make way for the new power. Right. So you're talking about electrical power. That's correct. As, well, as far as I know, okay. that's correct. So the, the water work is ex exclusive of this. That's, so you're, right, the water. Sure, and let me, if I may, I think there's a little bit of disconnect between the question and Indeed the answer. Indeed there is, yeah. Um, and, and certainly um, recognize the questions that you're answer, asking. This goes back over, when you ask who it was negotiated with, goes back over two administrations with lots of people involved at this at different times, obviously. So how would you answer that question, who negotiated this agreement? So obviously we worked with the mayor's office, both under Who mayor, specifically in the mayor's office so did you work with? So we worked with Matt Wilshire, we've worked with Rich Riebling, we've worked with Emily Pacini, we have worked, I mean, well, obviously with Public Works, with Water, I mean, we've gone through numerous meetings. My guess is 12 who, different people as a part of that. Okay, who else was at the table? Director Potter would have been there representing Water, Mr. Sturdivant representing, who, who else was at the table? Correct. Uh, other people in their offices at different times, obviously. We, we've been, I mean, this process started with Nashville Yards coming in and saying, here's what we're thinking about the project in general. Here's specifically what we're thinking about infrastructure. Obviously, there are things that we, the, the Nashville Yards is being asked to do that is beyond what have, would be required, uh, beyond what is needed for that project, and certainly other opportunities while we're there under, under the streets. I mean, the plan was to open the streets one time so that we didn't have to do that multiple times. Understood. And as a result of that, where the negotiation landed, in fact, I, I'm not even sure landed, what, what Metro said is we believe 15.25 million of this is subject, well, actually 16.7 million of this is eligible for reimbursement. And that's as we looked at, at separate line items and separate groups of work. And what Metro said is we're comfortable um, I think to Director Potter's issue, I mean, you've, you've got some engineering variants here, but we're comfortable that the work that's being done that we've either asked you all to do or that goes beyond what is needed or benefits beyond this site is 15.25 million. And then it was, we, we had no involvement, the Nashville Yards had no involvement with how that was funded. And so obviously we've heard 3.25 million of that would come from water and the balance of that would come from public works. W one other thing that I might add just while I'm here, the, the line item for project construction management has nothing to do with Colliers. Colliers, is not, Colliers does not work for Nashville Yards and is not being paid out of that line item at all. It's for Nashville Yards, architects, engineers, contingency, all the other work that's not direct hard to the mm -hmm. to the contractor. But did Director Sturdivant not stand here in this budget and finance meeting and mention or rather say that that is who that who Metro would use for that work? Yeah, so I, I don't know that that was his answer. If it was, it was a misunderstanding. I know he came back in the Public Works Committee and said to date that they thought about $2,000 had been paid to Colliers and that they estimated for the life of this project, I think approximately 100000 if I remember that correctly. But none of that was to be paid for by Nashville Yards or this was Nashville Yards' direct cost to this project and that has nothing to do with Colliers. Okay. All right. But you can understand why, based on the responses in this committee and then again in public works, that that would be concerning given recent news. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Henderson. I don't know. We have a lot of council members for discussion of Amendment C. Um, just be patient. This is where uh, we ask the tough questions and where we do the vetting. Uh, Councilman Cooper. Um, thank you so much, Chair. I'll try to be uh, quick with my questions, and I appreciate everybody uh, being here. Just um, may stand so I can see in the back a little bit. Um, as I was following Councilman, Council Lady Henderson's questions for water, um, the view, Director, is that eligible for reimbursement is about $6.7 million. Yes, sir. And of which your department's policy is 
50 percent or about 3.25 million? We don't have a set number. We, we get together to discuss the merits of the project and where we'd be, we would feel comfortable participating. Okay. And we but reached a conclusion where that would be. 50% is, is the three and a quarter, and that, that sort of trues it up to the amount that's eligible for reimbursement. Yes, sir. Okay. So I guess my confusion is if this whole list of eligible for reimbursement is 16.7 million, of which water eligible for reimbursement is 6.7, and you all at a 50% rate is 3.25, then why are we appropriating the greater than $15 million number? Why aren't we living up to this 50% participation, which does sound like a good deal for the city, but really we're reimbursing $6.7 million on this schedule? Well, I'm speaking specifically for water, sewer, and stormwater only. Okay. And, and I'll, um, you know, this may not be nice to say, but I think we're taking Nashville Yards, we're getting a really good deal from the water sewer side. Um, oh. I think we negotiated pretty darn well. Well, and I know everybody in that area is looking forward to investment and improvements, but I'm just, I'm just footing back to what's eligible for reimbursement and then what is our participation rate on that. And I know a lot of people are in the queue, so I have a couple of other questions for the various parties. I am told pretty reliably, and you're probably not, maybe not the right person to answer this question, that the state of Tennessee is actually reimbursing for some of the site cost on the Amazon site. So I it's have no, no idea about that. Well, would would attorney, would Charles Robert address that? Because I, I was a little bit surprised by that because I thought Metro was going to be, it had not, you know, in this you know, it's always unclear what the state is doing, but is the state also covering some of the site costs for Nashville Yards? No, sir, not to my knowledge. Okay, well, it was a pretty reliable source, so... Um, if, but if you would share that, I'd be happy to look into it. I know Amazon has a separate incentives package with the state, but not one penny of that comes to Nashville Yards. Not one penny, but, but some of that might flow to uh, uh, the tenant there for their incentives to the, to yeah, well, the tenant. I think all of, the, all of their incentives from Metro and the state mm -hmm. are going to flow to the tenant. Yes, sir. So, and then they would be allowed to use that as an improvement in their own building, presumably, sure. if in fact the state money is flowing to Amazon. Presumably so, sure. Okay, all right. But there may be some state funding that's going on in the site through the tenant Amazon. Again, n nothing of that comes to Nashville Yards, not, not one penny from the state. Everything that Amazon gets is going directly to Amazon. Okay, thank you so much. Again, trying to be quick, this came up last time. Uh, part of this whole participation agreement is the easement on 10th Avenue South, and I see our marvelous representative from public property here. What do you think the value of that easement is? I mean, is it... Very valuable, not valuable. I mean, to a lot of people, you look at this project and you would not really be able to do this project without that easement. So it would seem very valuable. I'm going to need you to come to the microphones, Mayor. Y'all should be prepared for that question. He asked it on <laughs> multiple deals. But, and, and, I, and I appreciate it, and I under, also understand that this is just sort of an advisory view of an easement and what its value in the market might be, as in, like, it could be quite a bit, or Public not at property all. hasn't valued that easement. It has not valued it. Right. Okay. Thank Well, and that's the answer you're most comfortable with, I have a feeling, but so thank right. you. I don't mean to put it on your spot, but we've asked this in other committee meetings several times. Um, in the letter that the council received, um, it says a statement, and again, this may be back for the back of the room, that um, much of this infrastructure and enhanced capacity will, will serve to benefit other areas. This is also a question that I've asked before. Um, much of the benefit, how much of this capacity will be used for other areas? Okay. For, for water or for... Well, for so I, I think the first slug of the public works money, so uh, Director Potter is obviously uh, best positioned to answer the, the water piece of it, mm -hmm. although I've been in enough meetings to 
uh, have developed a, 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 a little bit of water knowledge. But as an example, the first, uh, first piece that's to be improved is the intersection of Broadway and 10th. And that would serve anyone going from okay. downtown out Broadway um, or anywhere around Union Station, uh, the Frist uh, Museum, or through that intersection. If they work downtown, if they okay. go to school at Hume Fogg, if they go to... So much of the capacity, I'm just trying to put a, a sense of what much means in this case. From a water and sewer perspective, um, I'm going back to how I responded to Council Lady Henderson in that it's going to be difficult to quantify. Okay. Um, I can start at a dollar spent in this circumstance is not a dollar spent in 15 years. Um, from our perspective, once again, when we earn knowledge of this development, our first reaction was yay, because it's going to give us an opportunity to get new infrastructure. Um, from that point, our level of participation is we set a goal to minimize it because we want to use that dollar elsewhere. And that shrewd 50% of right. value so scheme. If I've, got, if I've got a brand new ductile iron water main from here to there, and it replaces a cast iron water main from 1900, I've got a, an operational advantage that's really, um, it's impossible to quantify because operationally, as an example, a cast iron pipe is much more susceptible to failure, especially in temperature changes. A ductile iron pipe is not going to be as susceptible to failure. Um, a cast iron pipe may be tuberculated on the inside because it doesn't have a concrete liner. A ductile iron pipe will not be. So you can talk about losses in friction over the, over the course of 60 years. How do you value that? Oh, I appreciate that, and I love your policy department's policy on 50% value reimbursement. That's not but a policy here, number, Councilman. We don't sit at 50%. But we, you're, we, you're we reimbursing don't. here at a much higher level out of this 15 and a quarter million dollars, aren't you? The, the 6.7 that's on the available for reimbursements, you were, I thought you were saying that that was you thought to be your, the, the cost of that. The cost of the entire water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure. And we're participating in 3.25. Please jump in if I get the numbers mixed up. Okay. Well, then how is it that the reimbursable list is for 6.7? Because that's the cost of all the infrastructure associated with water, sewer, and stormwater. Okay. We, I guess we're having a disconnect here. Um, um, you all are committed to three and a quarter million dollars. Yes, sir. Okay. But Nashville Yards is going to get a check for over 90% of the $6.7 million. Now you're entering a realm that I don't have any knowledge of. Okay. All right. Well, it's a deep question, and I guess I would... Councilman the, Cooper, we'll let his CFO. She can. Okay. She should be able to Thank answer you. that. Thank you. The, there is a $6.67 million line, there are actually two lines that make up, those, make up the total. We... When we got the engineering estimate, we looked at the engineering estimate, which was some time ago, and we said we would participate. It's an engineering ju judgment, as Mr. Potter says, and we would contribute at a $3.25 million level. I understand that there is a balance, and that makes our participation less than 50%. But water's con contribution is 3.25. The remainder of that funding is not... I'd, we cannot oh. state where that comes from. Okay. Thank you. And thank all of you all. I mean, I'm the biggest fan of the water department that exists, and I love what you do. So this is in no way being critical. We're just trying to foot this back to the reimbursables uh, and just make sure that we're doing the right thing because government spending on a private site, you do have to be careful. So one final quick question for Public Works. On sidewalks, which is where this amendment started, uh, I suppose, don't we require other private developers to put in sidewalks now? We do. That's we, correct. We do. Okay. So to some degree, other developers could look at this and say, why is this a most favored developer and you are paying for the sidewalks, whereas we have to pay for our sidewalks? Wouldn't this be something that other developers might say to you? Um, that, that's possible. Okay. Yes, Super thankful. Grateful for everybody. I do uh, urge... Um, 
really adoption of this amendment, but really further look in terms of the reimbursables and what we're spending money for on this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman Cooper, to relate that to your committee as it relates to the amendment. We're still on discussion for Amendment C. Councilwoman Weiner. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Um, I have a couple of questions for Mr. Bone. Attorney Bone. Getting my work out of up and down. I told you, you should have just stayed up there. So if there were no participation agreement and if Metro were having to foot the bill for all of this infrastructure work, what's that cost? And it may be something that Mr. Potter may well, have to I, answer, Mr. Wilshire. So certainly if there were no participation agreement, um, Obviously, a lot of the things that Nashville Yards has been asked to do and agreed to do beyond what is necessary wouldn't be a part of this. Take the example earlier of the 10th and Broad realignment. There are three new signalizations, two rebuilt signalizations just as a part of that work. Obviously, the agreement to convey, convey the, the park to a conservation easement to designate the Frost Building as a historic landmark. And I think what what you heard from Director Potter is that all of this work Metro might not do immediately, but at some point it's gonna get done. And at that point, obviously it's gonna be more expensive given the cost of time, but also the efficiencies you're picking up with opening the streets up one time, I think is, is fairly significant. I have a couple more questions, but I think Scott wanted to say something. So an additional thing to, to take into consideration is if Metro did all this ourselves, you're talking about a completely separate design team, a, a separate construction team on a very busy site. So that's going to be more expense because the contractors would have to coordinate with each other on who's doing what on Tuesday. So there's even additional benefit to be, to be gained from one contractor and one construction firm doing all the work unilaterally. So that's an additional savings if Metro had to do all the work. Okay, thank you, that helps. Mr. Bone, could you please also share with us, um, there was a question just a minute ago to Mr. Doyle about sidewalks sure. and the fact that we're not making you pay for those sidewalks, yes, uh, or so we might for others, but what I'd like to know, in exchange for what we are giving you, can you share the specific list of amenities that we're getting from this project in addition to the infrastructure. Sure, so um, I mean, let's start with the tax, I mean, take away the economic impact, take away the jobs, right. to even put sales tax to the side. Just looking solely at property tax, this is a site that Lifeway had before that has paid zero in property tax for, for the last 100 years. Nashville Yards to date has paid about 3.4 million, including 1.8 million for the 2018 taxes. Each year that's gonna increase significantly. It's going to, you're gonna end up between now and 2045 of having paid about $430 million in property taxes. The net present value of that is $10 million a year. And so to your sidewalk question is, um, let me answer that two ways. Of, of all the work that is in the participation agreement and is a part of the 16.7 million, only 571,000 of that work relates to sidewalks at all. And that's a, that's a pretty generous calculation when you consider the curbs, ramps, everything else as a part of that. But two, here, we're providing $80 million worth of infrastructure, 65 million um, at our own cost. And so I would think that makes it a little unique in why you would say, uh, is this a place where we would do the cost of the sidewalks since we're now in the right of way, we're opening up the right of way, they've gotta be replaced as a part of that. Having said all this, I appreciate all the questions, I appreciate the thoroughness of the line items, but what we tried to, to, to reach was an overall deal that everybody felt good about was a fair participation in order for Metro to get all of those amenities out of this and, and what, what was eligible for reimbursement as a part of that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. So, I guess just um, my two cents about this is, it, as council members were supposed to trust but verify, and I appreciate the diligence of, of looking at everything. However, um, I'm not an engineer. I'm not gonna go through and try and redesign and, and reevaluate every bolt and screw that goes into a project that is way beyond um, what I believe our scope of practice is. 
Having said that, I think it's important, as I shared before on our addressing Amendment A, was the costs, are, as Mr. Vona shared, are substantially lower. The revenue that we will generate is substantially higher. Jobs, amenities, and I think it's time for us to just move forward and let's get this job done. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Weiner. Um, we have colleagues uh, in the queue. Um, I will be recognizing uh, committee members first. Councilman Glover. Chair, thank you. So what You're I would welcome. like to ask, if I may, and first of all, let me say thank you, because I believe this is what we're supposed to do in committee. I think we're supposed to have these conversations to debate the whole issue and try and figure out where we are. So I'm not certain who I asked this question to. You can tell me who I should, um, or after I ask, and I have two questions, and I'll try and keep it brief. When I ask the first question, if you wouldn't mind, tell me who you think I should address it to. And then when I ask the second question, if you wouldn't mind, I will address it to whoever you so choose for me to, to address it to, Chair. Is that fair? Go ahead, Councilman Glover. Thank you. Given that in the last several years, there's been $35,000 spent in my district on sidewalks, virtually no other improvements whatsoever in my district as far as the city is concerned. How do I go back and sell this to my folks and say, this is the right thing to do? I don't care who answers that. I'm more than happy to listen to the, the so, answer. So Councilman Glover, what I'm hearing two parts, we'll have <coughs> someone from the administration that answered the part as it relates to selling it to your constituents. And then the other part, we'll have a representative from Public Works address the lack thereof of infrastructure in your respective district. Yes, and, and I didn't mean it to sound like two questions in that because I have one more question. So it's okay. however we want to do it, that's, that's fine. That's your two for, for today, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> that's your two for one. Mr. Thank Wilshire. You. Thank you, Councilman Glover. Um, I, I think the, I, I'm happy to go through the merits of the bill overall. I don't know if we were just sort of addressing the specific this amendments. This question was, how does he sell it to his district? Sure. The benefits of this project to his district. Sure. And many other council members have the same question. So don't, don't take it as if you're just addressing Councilman Glover, but you're addressing everyone in the, in the chamber. Yes, ma'am. Um, so this project, uh, as Attorney Bowen just mentioned, will be a significant economic boom to this city. It is both developing infrastructure efficiently because it's downtown at a relatively lower cost than building out greenfield new subdivisions. And so the infrastructure investment in downtown is actually even more efficient in terms of an outlay, um, in terms of building up infrastructure. And citizens from across the county repeatedly talk about the need to have additional infrastructure in this city as we grow. It's something we hear in Donaldson, Hermitage, Bellevue, Antioch, if we're going to grow as a city, we have to invest in infrastructure. And what we are doing in this project is efficiently, and we believe effectively, investing in the infrastructure of the city in a way that will generate tens of millions of dollars that we can then plow back into other things that you have been such a passionate advocate for, including sidewalks across the county, cost of living adjustment for employees, and everything else. And so we believe that this is an efficient and effective way to help our city develop in a way that we can fund the things that we all passionately care about. And we believe it's extraordinarily important to support projects like this that have an immediate payoff through the infrastructure participation agreement and through incremental amenities like parks on the site, but have broad benefits for citizens who are gonna live around the county. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. So, Councilman Glover, I, I believe your question is, and, and by all means, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, um, why is there a lack of infrastructure dollars being spent on sidewalks in your district? Okay. In downtown versus the city as on the whole? Well, I... I <laughs> I don't know that I can specifically answer the question about how to sell it to your constituents other than the economic impacts and benefits that, that have been raised by 
by Mr. Wiltshire, um, but but uh, um, along the lines of, of uh, how sidewalks get built countywide, you know. We, we, we have a, a dedicated funding source that's part of our budget towards the sidewalk program. And, and as part of that, we comply with the walk-bike plan that was established and, and, and developed in concert with the council and other metro agencies and departments. And so that really is the, is the tool that we use on prioritizing how we, how we as a department construct sidewalks around the county. Um, so as it relates to this this specific project, I, I believe the, uh, the the funding is coming out of out of out of our, um, our roadway budget, and so so consequently, it's not impacting uh, the uh, the implementation of the the sidewalk plan and the sidewalk budget as it currently exists. Madam Chair, I must apologize because apparently I was not clear on my question. My my the the. Example I gave was the $35,000 on a sidewalk project in my district over the last several years. There's been basically various, actually there's really not been any other true improvements, so I apologize for not being clear. That, that I, Next time I'll try to be much better at that. So, when we look at the priorities throughout the entire district, if I look at various council members here in the district where things have not occurred and we keep asking for things to occur, every time we do this, they ask us to vote to give up a lot of money. And then we have to go back and we have to listen to our constituents who elect us. Those are the people who elect us. And we have to answer them on why this is the right thing for our city. I'm trying to figure out how we do this. And right now, I'm not getting there because this has not been a two-way street over the last seven and a half years I've been sitting in this chair. So whoever wants to answer that, I'm, I am more than happy to listen on what the answer is. Thank you, Councilman Glover. I believe, uh it's been it's been asked and answered as the benefits as it relates to the project for for the overall city. Yeah, I'm but not go, not Council in my Glover, district. I'm gonna go ahead and move us along. Thank yeah. you, Councilwoman Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a few clarifying questions uh, for Mr. Potter. I think um, this was somewhat alluded to, but I, I just think it's helpful to have it explicitly said. If if you were to replace all this infrastructure with all of those buildings there. Can you, I mean, can you give us a multiplier even of how much more it would cost to, to do all that? I'm glad you brought that up, because um, I failed to think about that. Director Potter, just your best figure, because that can help Councilman Glover also. Just your, just your best figure. Well, um, I can really conservatively say at least three times, because if we, if Lifeway still stands, and we go into that neighborhood and tear up everything and put in what is going in now, um, I would, I'll be conservative and say three times um, because it's just going, it would, it would be extraordinarily disruptive to that, uh, that neighborhood at least three times. Thank you. So this this creates an amazing opportunity to have the whole slate wiped clean. Like I clean. said, but I think last commu last committee meeting, this is exactly what we want because we had a neighborhood that was being renewed. We saw an op an opportunity to get in there and fix everything, and we got to tell National Yards what we wanted, and they had to do what we wanted. Then we started the negotiation process about who's paying for what. So for a 50% participation, I'm, if I could do a cartwheel, I'd do it because it's really that good. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to say Mr. Bone's a bad negotiator, but from our perspective, you know, we, we got a great deal out of this from the water and sewer perspective. Sorry I'm about sorry that. I don't get to see the, the cartwheel. Um, and then secondly, um, just in terms of when you're doing infrastructure problem, I mean, uh, repairs, 
How often do you come upon surprises that you wish you had put extra money in the budget for? Well, um, I can honestly say that we could responsibly spend capital money forever because there's, there's that much work to be done. A good example was, uh, I think about three weeks ago, we had a break um, in front of um, the um, Fulton campus. That, that infrastructure was in the ground when Abraham Lincoln was president. So that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. Downtown, you know, y'all heard Councilor Henderson, um, the specs, 1900 cast iron. It's, um, it's well exceeded its useful life. We use a 100 year depreciation curve on our um, infrastructure. So. Okay, and then final, final question, because because I am an engineer, and I know that when I do budgeting, I hate budgeting, because there's, there's just no way to know what it's, what it's actually going to, I mean, you can, you can go through and look at all the pieces and parts and add them together, and that's not what it's going to cost. So I, I applaud the folks that can come up with any, any kind of realistic number. When you um, gave Nashville Yards directions on what you want them to put in, Councilmember Henderson men, men, mentioned different sizes of pipes. That gave you the opportunity to enlarge the size of a lot of pipes so that now more can flow out to the rest of Nashville. Is that, is that correct? I think the correct phraseology would be right size because um, we had a very good and accurate representation of demand in that neighborhood from a water and sewer side. We also got to handle the stormwater runoff a little bit better um, from a combined system perspective. And I mentioned the odor issues that were prevalent in the neighborhood. We were able to correct that. So overall, it's, um, it's a success for Metro okay. Water. Okay, thank you. And then um, I think that, that may be all my questions in. Um, I guess this may not be for you. At the top of Exhibit B, which lists the work that w the reimbursement would come from, there's an item called Environmental Cleanup, TBD. Does that, does that come under you or Public Works? Or, and is that an amount that, should, that would be expected to be part of this if it if it were discovered, determined that there was a cost there. I'm gonna let um, Attorney Bowen answer Mr. specifically from, from his perspective, but whenever we do a, a construction project, any kind of remediation is on the contractor. And then and we're in a regulatory position to make sure that that occurs. Gotcha. Okay. Does Mr. Bowen have anything to add to that? Attorney Bowen. Sure. Uh, I mean, there will obviously be some expense associated with that. We don't expect that to be a 5 or a $10 million expense if that's what you ask, but certainly we recognize that that has to be done, and we certainly recognize that that is on our risk. Gotcha. Okay. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Allen. Councilman Mendez. Thanks. Um, I don't have questions. Um, I do think uh, that, uh, so I'm going to vote against the amendment. Uh, to me, the pitch to constituents is along the lines of what Mr. Potter has been talking about. Um, all, all these things are on the long-term wish list for the city from infrastructure. This is a once in a generation, maybe once in two generation cost uh, opportunity to put it in the ground for lower cost. All the infrastructure is lower cost now than it would happen otherwise. Importantly, there's no tax income and financing here, so we're gonna collect every last penny of the property taxes, and the split is $65 million worth of infrastructure to the developer and 15 million for Metro. Um, frankly, we should do this, uh, th this deal is easy to understand. Um, some, there's some talk about, well, we can't fund employees, then um, we shouldn't do this. Um, you know, my view, I think, no surprise to anybody, the failure to get the appropriate revenue for the city last summer was a self-inflicted wound, and failing to pass this um, would just be another self-inflicted wound. This is an opportunity um, to uh, once in a couple generations to get a lot of infrastructure for a lot lower cost than we could possibly do it otherwise. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Mendez. Councilwoman Dow. I just had a quick question to ask, um, just to verify that I heard right. Is this property not in one of the redevelopment zones? I know we didn't collect tax before because it was part of Lifeway, but is it not in one of the redevelopment districts that we have downtown? Attorney Baum? It is not in a redevelopment district. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Dow. Councilman Bettany, were you seeking recognition? Okay. Oh, just uh, a small comment about the importance of uh, connecting uh, uh, what we do with the impact of it. Uh, that's kind of what we're doing on this legislation. 
And uh, I just wanted to bring that about because it, it may resonate with some of you with my other legislation that I have. I know it's not specific about this, but uh, it's important to connect uh, the dots on when we do something and the impact of it. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Batney. We're on discussion for Amendment C. Councilman O'Connor, I'm going to come to you last, being that you, you are a sponsor on this also. Councilwoman Henderson. Uh, thank you, Chair Bircher. Uh, I just wanted to clarify for colleagues that um, I, too, support a participation agreement for this project. I appreciate that our water department and our public works department uh, is working uh, with this developer. So I am not against a participation agreement. I am simply doing due diligence as vice chair of the Public Works Committee to look at how we are participating and to what degree we are participating. So all Amendment C does is reduce that participation from $16.693 million to $11.487 million. So voting for Amendment C is not, uh, you know, uh, a, a negative or, or, you know, saying that you uh, don't support this participation agreement. Um, I think uh, Director Potter has spoken well to uh, the need for utility upgrades. I uh, do still have concerns um, that we have, you know, uh, some dollars going where I, I, I feel personally it's unnecessary. But uh, that said, this is not, um, you know, cutting that all out, and specifically as it relates to streets and sidewalks, uh, to Councilman Cooper's point, we do, colleagues, require other developers to build sidewalks related to their uh, development. So, um, uh, you know, I think it's appropriate that we're participating in the utility space um, but I do not think it's appropriate that we are uh, participating there. And then further, as it relates to traffic signalization and uh, the intersection at 10th and Broadway, um, we went pretty deep on this in Public Works Committee as to what were the merits of improving that intersection. And why is that intersection so important comparatively to other intersections in our city? say like Trinity Lane, where three people have died in the last two years because they can't cross the street, okay? So we are not putting appropriate levels of scrutiny on our buckets uh, of roadways that some of this is coming out of, our buckets of intersections. And so when we do participate in this agreement to pay in part for the improvement of a traffic signal related to Nashville yards, that does indeed mean that we don't have sufficient funding to improve other intersections. So I have asked the Public Works Department, I have asked the mayor's office at the last uh, council meeting, no one has elevated 10th and Broadway other than the fact that it's slightly wonky and offset a little bit, that it needs to be improved for a safety standpoint. If it needs to be improved as it relates to capacity, that is specific to this development and is incumbent upon this development to fund. So Amendment C looks at that uh, traffic signalization piece. It looks at the street and sidewalks, the things that we ask other developers all over this city to do. But in the utility space, that remains the same. All the advantages that Director Potter spoke to remain. So Amendment C merely is bringing an extra level of scrutiny and fairness to this participation agreement, in my view. Thank you, Chair Virtue. Thank you, Councilwoman Henderson. Councilwoman Gilmore. Thank you. I just said I wanted, I wanted to thank uh, Councilmember Henderson for all of her hard work. I mean, she's really delved into the numbers and made a lot of calls, so I do appreciate that. And for the least listening audience, I, I do want them to know that for each council member, it is very difficult for them to get infrastructure in their community, so this conversation is not a frivolous conversation at all, so I just wanted uh, Council Member Henderson to know that I appreciated her. I had a question for um, Matt. Who is going to do the oversight, like the checkoffs, since this is a partnership? Do we get reports back? 
or updates as it relates to these projects, as it relates to infrastructure? Yes, ma'am. So um, all of this infrastructure, both the uh, 15.25 that would be paid for by Metro under this agreement, and in fact, actually, um, I believe all of the $79.4 million is actually public infrastructure. I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but all of the infrastructure that becomes public infrastructure is our infrastructure. And before it can be turned over to Metro, whether it's the water department or public works, streets, signalization, has to be signed off on by the department. So our departments will be approving all of the infrastructure before we take possession of it. So they will be approving it? Yes. Okay, thank you. You're and welcome. then I just wanted to make um, one closing comment. A, a lot of times we uh, lean on uh, privatization for certain projects that we have, and whereas it may st save money, I think the issue that we run into as council members is that it may not always be equitable. So saving money does not always equate to equity, and I think that's what we're looking at in terms of projects in the in our neighborhoods versus what we do for development and what they create in terms of jobs and how expeditiously they can do it, and then how much participation we have. So I think that's, those are one of the things that we have to look at as we move forward, and I think everyone wants to see our city do great, but we have to continue to think of this as we continue to have more disparities growing in more neighborhoods and more communities. So whereas it may be expeditious and it may cost savings in the long run, it may not be cost savings if we have people that could have otherwise participated, not participating, and we're paying them in terms of government supports uh, systems to keep them afloat. So we just kind of want to think about that in the long run when we say, oh, well, this is just a really great deal or this was just so wonderful. But what does that mean as we continue to explore projects when we uh, let developers do them or we contract them out. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Gilmore. Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. I'm really trying not to talk again because I, I would like to actually hear an answer, but I don't think we're there yet. So I have a developer in my district that has already spent nearly $100,000 on actual site work, et cetera, that's occurred. I had $500,000 under the Dane administration that was given to work on some of the stuff in my district, and we have not even had, not a shovel lifted yet on it. So it makes it really hard for me to agree with this. And while I appreciate the fact that we want to always look after downtown, downtown survives because my folks, other people in this district or in this, this council represent people who feed into downtown, who work in downtown and spend their money downtown. So therefore, I mean, it, it's really a challenge to try and figure out how do we do this? How, and when I ask the question, how do I go back and sell it? I'm sorry, I hadn't heard it yet. I've heard the same things I've heard over and over and over, but here's what I have not seen, nor what my folks have seen in my district. Anything happening. So, Madam Chair, I know I aggravate you sometimes. I apologize for that. However, I want to apologize for trying to watch out for what I'm supposed to do by the people who elect me and try and protect them on what my job is to make sure they're represented as well because we have failed my district. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Glover. Councilwoman Henderson, were you seeking ad additional recognition? You are not? Thank you. Okay, um, Councilman O'Connell, you are last. That, conclude, that will conclude our discussion and then we'll finally be able to take a vote on Amendment C. Be brief. I will do my best. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I have to say, I, I'm going to give credit to Council Lady Henderson here. The, the diligence here is impressive, and yet I'm rising to say I'm, I'm going to discourage colleagues on this committee uh, from supporting Amendment C, and I'll, I'll explain why. And, uh, you know, maybe the, the folks in District 12 can take some comfort from this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rewind for just a minute. As we think about these multipliers, as we think about 
how our public investment here is being leveraged, I also want to just look at this in, in that context of downtown and the rest of the city because I am absolutely in favor of strategic distributed investment citywide. So I'm going to go back to November of 2016. You know, somebody has championed uh, our pedestrian infrastructure for quite some time. I was excited for the letter dated November 29th, 2016 uh, under Director Sturdivant's hand where the subject was upcoming sidewalk capital improvements in your council district. Uh, and so I got to the, the part that is not actually in bold, but it's the part that uh, is, is the bottom line of this letter. It was not recommended to utilize fiscal year 2016-2017 capital sidewalks funds for new sidewalks under the current fiscal year in District 19. Now, I didn't read that, Madam Chair, and think to myself, well, you know, darn it, we're not getting any new sidewalks in District 19. I know we have built a lot of sidewalks in District 19. But what I thought is someday we're going to have the opportunity to leverage the overall, the, the thing that is consistent with Nashville Next, downtown is this extraordinary center of, of economic activity, uh, density, the things that people have said they don't generally want in their communities, in their neighborhoods, uh, that people in District 19 are generally content to have to some extent. And we're going to be able to build infrastructure even though we get zero dollars for actual sidewalk funds in District 19. Uh, this is how we, it, it, it's just a little different when we think about the scale. I know Councilman Cooper has referenced the concerns about, uh, well, gosh, wouldn't every developer do this? Well, the truth be told is not every developer is pulling properties off, you know, yanking them back onto our property tax rolls and offering these extraordinary multipliers. There are some cases where it is actually reasonable to offer the exception, and I would say that the Nashville Yards project is exactly that. This is how we get better infrastructure without the necessity of also asking for traditional capital dollars, and it is giving us extraordinary opportunities to leverage the scale, as Director Potter has noted, for wonderful mathematical opportunities. I would encourage folks to just let this participation agreement go. We've had fantastic discussion on it, uh, and ultimately, uh, those, those infrastructure pieces that are a part of the gateway are gonna serve other developments along Broadway, including the large Fifth and Broadway development, they're going to serve all of the other private development that is not getting participation agreements along a new gateway to downtown and Broadway from the river well past where it becomes West End all need great, uh, great infrastructure. So this is a piece of that, and I encourage folks to support the original participation agreement without Amendment C. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman O'Connor. We have no further discussion. We are voting on Amendment C. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, we're going to need show of hands. Raise them high. No alligator arms. All in favor? Opposed? Amendment C fails. Now we are, we have so much uh, discussion. Now we are back on uh, the bill as amended. It's not amended. The original bill. Uh, okay. Yeah, it tells me it's, it's as amended. Yeah. Okay. Now we're back on the bill as amended. All in favor? Opposed? Okay, we're going to need show of hands. All in favor? Opposed? Bill will be recommended. Now we're back at the top of our agenda. We'll begin with resolutions. I'll give you a second to get there. You're following on your tablet. Attorney Jamison, you ready? I'm ready. <clears throat> we'll start with resolutions. RS 2019-1559, sponsors O'Connell and Betney. 
modifies the master list of architects and engineers originally approved by resolution number RS-94-1050. I believe there is a proposed amendment. Can I get a motion to move it? It's been moved and properly seconded. Councilwoman Allen. I just need to be recorded as abstaining. Duly noted. Do you have the amendment, Mr. Jameson? Mr. Jameson, can you tell us what the this proposed amendment? The amendment appears on page 33 of your packet. Um, this amendment would essentially delete the entry for Collier Engineering, the 28th line item on Exhibit A to the master list. Councilwoman Henderson. Uh, thank you, Chair Vircher. Um I spoke uh, last week uh, with uh, uh, Director uh, Hernandez Lane, um, as well as uh, uh, Auditor Swan, um, as it related to uh, this master list. And my concern that given uh, recent uh, news stories that indicate that uh, Collier Engineering has been uh, unethically uh, billing uh, our city, um, that advancing this master list uh, with Collier on it would be on our part as a council, a tacit approval of them uh, as, as a firm. Um, and so at that time, um, I engaged uh, in uh, a conversation about kind of what the options were um, as related to, um, you know, suspension and, and, and so forth from, uh, from that list. Um, but uh, we have, I think, uh, a, a variety of uh, options here. Um, and I guess I would ask uh, that uh, Ms. L uh, Hernandez Lane um, uh, speak to this, please. Before she um, comes up, Councilwoman Henderson, we're on the original resolution. Go ahead and move the amendment. I so and I would move the, I'm not sure, it's on page 33, but uh, Mr. Jameson, does this have an, an, a number or? I just no, move this, the amendment. It's the only amendment. Okay, I would I would move the amendment, please. It's been moved and seconded. Now we're on the amendment for discussion. Um, Director Lane, if you can come up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Director Lane. Um, can you speak to this, please? You, when we spoke on the phone. Um, said that you were uncomfortable with removing this. Um, that said, uh, subsequent to our uh, speaking, you received a letter um, uh, from Ms. Patrell, um, our compliance officer. There have been additional news stories um, uh, with concerns. Um, no doubt our audit committee um, will want to revisit uh, our audit. Um, both based on what was substantiated and items that were previously unsubstantiated but have now, we have further evidence of. And so, uh, you know, we talked about a variety of approaches of how to address this so that this council would not be endorsing the unethical business practices of Collier. And so um, I guess I would ask you specifically to speak to this amendment and uh, would you support this approach at this time of m removing Collier uh, from this master list update? Um, well, what I would first say is related to our previous conversation, um, we did not have any specific detail about any of the information that has since uh, given rise in the media. Um, and the, the scope of our conversation really was as it related to the audit findings at, or recommendations, observations and recommendations at that time. As it relates to this amendment that you've put forth, um, what it does basically is that it leaves Call Your Engineering on the ANI master list. However, it does not allow that they um, have any of the information that is specified in the procurement regulations to be updated. That information is very specifically the addition of architecture work as part of the scope of what they perform. Um, it relates also to the numbers of employees uh, that they have. Uh, the update also uh, modified their address as well as their specific point of contact uh, for procurement purposes. So all of that information is not updated and therefore added to the master list. Uh, what that means is that the information that was there previously, uh, that existing information, would remain there. 
The impact on the procurement process is that if we were to solicit uh, services uh, in the area where the additional license that they've identified was required, they would not be able to meet that requirement and therefore not be eligible. So the additional license you speak to, so is Collier Engineering now bidding for architectural work? They are licensed by the state of, uh, the state of Tennessee to perform architecture work. That's not uncommon. We have a number of firms who are on the list uh, indicating that they have folks um, who are licensed in their firms as architects and then folks who are also licensed as engineers. Given recent concerns, should we really be expanding Collier Engineering's capacity to work in that regard? I mean, if, if I, I guess what I would ask is um, what has precipitated this urgent need to update our master list when it hasn't been updated since 2012? That is the answer. The list has not been updated in quite some time. But we, why now in the midst of all this scrutiny? Is well, this really good timing? Well, I think? think it is very good timing because I'm required uh, by the procurement regulations to assist the finance director in maintaining that list. Okay. And so that, that update began quite some time ago, actually. We began scrubbing you know, the list to understand those firms that we have active contracts with and to ensure that we had updated information for, if no one else, the firms that the city actually has active contracts with. It just so happens that the culmination of all of that work is now. I would also note um, that we are adding some firms to the list. So there are some firms who've never been on the master list before, and they have provided the information necessary to be added to the list. And I think that in the interest of um, fair and open competition, we should grant them access to the list. Oh, I absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, when did you begin the process to scrutinize the existing list and kind of scrub that and update it? It's been close to a year. Okay, so you started that work in? Shortly after I came into this role. Okay. Um, and so for the new firms that are being added, um, how were they uh, in, invited to do so? Was that an open call? Or how did you choose the firms that you have, that you are also adding to the master list through this update? Yep. So uh, again, we looked initially at those firms that we do have existing contracts or with whom we have existing contracts. We also looked at some firms who had uh, expressed interest in specific solicitations. Um, I will note that Collier Engineering is not one of those firms because they were already on the existing list, but those were additional firms who were interested in specific metro projects. Um, we sent them the list or the form, I should say, to be completed um, so that they could be considered. Ultimately, the selection on a and &E, um, contracts, it goes through to a review board, and then that review board uh, per the charter and the code, uh, make a recommendation to the mayor. So I honestly, in my professional capacity, don't in any way feel comfortable with submitting, you know, any, any specific interest to the mayor knowing that those firms have not been added to the master list. So was there an open call to every A&E firm um, doing work in Nashville, Tennessee? And there the was Tennessee? not. So there, there was not. There was not an open call to invite anyone and everyone who wanted to participate in the mm -hmm. procurement process to get on this master list. What, Do you not have to be on this master list to get work through Metro? You should, yes, you have okay. to. Mm -hmm. I would assert that before we update this list, perhaps we should do an open call to all A&E firms. Um, that seems fair. Well, on the Metro website, if you, were look at to, if you were to look at the procurement website, there is a specific section that speaks to architects and engineers. So folks have access to the information about what it requires. But in terms of reaching out to every architect and engineering firm that's out, you know, in the, in the not just the Metro area, but it would be open to anyone, even those out of state, uh, we've not engaged that process. Typically, right. those firms would reach out to us and say, hey, I'm very interested in being added to the master list because they're interested in pursuing work. So what's happened, I guess, over the last seven years when a firm reach out, reaches out and says they would like to work with Metro, but they weren't on the master list for seven whole years? I, I can't speak to it. Might that speak to why we continue to kind of 
reuse the same people and have mission creep, in my view, on some of our existing contracts? I, I can't, I mean, I, honestly, I can't speak to it. I just felt that it was incumbent upon me in this role to ensure that we maintain the lists consistent with the regulations. The regulations lay that requirement on the finance director as well as myself. And I felt that it was incumbent upon us to ensure that the list that we have, at least in so much as it relates to the active contracts that we have, that that information is updated. To your point, there are a number of other firms that are on that list in addition to the ones that we have an active contract with. So and how many firms are being added in addition? So there's the ones that are having active contracts mm -hmm. that are getting updated. So like for Collier, it's their Councilwoman Henderson, yes, I'm gonna have to ask for those additional questions, mm -hmm. if you can email those to Director Lane offline. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna interject in and ask Attorney Jamison, just for the committee, if you can explain what this resolution is and what it is not, so that we're clear on what we're actually voting on. The, um, not on the amendment, on the actual resolution. We're still on a discussion for the amendment, but I'm backtracking because I feel uh, I don't want to lose our quorum. Yes, so. I appreciate that. The, the Metro Code in Title II simply uh, provides that uh, for firms doing business with the metropolitan government that there be uh, a maintained master list for architects and engineers, um, last updated in 2012 pursuant to resolution. Uh, appearance on the list does not guarantee you will get uh, uh, be engaged by Metro, but you can't be engaged by Metro unless you appear on the list. Thank you, Attorney Jameson. I appreciate that. So, um, uh, Chair Bircher, if I may then, just about uh, the amendment. Um, are there then, uh, Ms. Lane, any, um, what would be uh, a negative or why would you not support the amendment to remove Collier Engineering from this master list? With, with all due respect, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do believe that it's not necessarily my job to support legislation, but it is certainly my job to carry out the legislation that you pass. Um, I will tell you again that if this amendment were to proceed, the impact to the list itself would be that Collier Engineering would continue to remain on the list. However, the additional license, which specifies the um, type of work on which they could compete and be selected would be limited to the work or to the license that was included in the original list or in the list that was last updated. Okay, so with this amendment, mm -hmm. even though we are, I think, colleagues making an important statement that we care um, how uh, Collier Engineering is represented and listed and participates in our procurement process, um, we would not be keeping them from doing any of the existing contract work that they are doing. They could just not expand the scope of the work that we're currently doing, which seems wholly appropriate given the concerns of the audit and otherwise, correct? And if, yes, and if I could, as a point of, of clarification, their existence on the master list as it is today does not have any bearing on their existing contracts. It does have bearing on their ability to be selected for future contracts. Right. So if this additional license was not added, mm -hmm. then they would not be eligible for selection for work that required that license. It does not impact their ability to be selected for work that requires the license for which the master list reflects today. Does that make sense? It does make sense, okay. and okay. I, I think that's wholly appropriate mm -hmm. um, given current concerns. So uh, with that, colleagues, I would encourage your support of this amendment to remove Collier Engineering from the master list update. And I would ask, Ms. Hernandez, mm -hmm. Lane, please, if you would please work with this council to make sure that your department, through some public venue, press release, or otherwise, invites wholly, fairly, transparently, openly, mm -hmm. Absolutely. all A&E firms in the region, nation, whatever, to, to get on our list. Mm -hmm. Because competition and fairness in this process, I'm sure you would agree, mm -hmm. um, uh, behooves our, our, our citizens, rather than the perception among many that, you know, that the work just keeps going to the same people it's always gone to. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Councilwoman Henderson. Councilman Prottmore. 
Ma Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first off, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on the amendment, which is uh, concerning the deletion of an engineering firm uh, rather than the addition of others. Uh, that's something on the original bill to discuss. But my, my concern is here we are again. Um, we're, we're I, I, don't, I don't want to say destroying the future, but we're, we're making a decision based on news media reports. News media reports. Yes, some of these reports were followed upon by Metro government, in which they should be, uh, but th th there are, th I don't think it has been properly vetted by, uh, Collier I think has responded to the initial uh, statement made or, uh, by the news media, and I thought was a valid, uh, Response and uh, uh, something that I'm, that occurs. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say frequently, but it does occur because it occurred to Metro government. Yes, we should be concerned, but concerned enough to destroy someone's future because of of uh, uh, statements made by the news media. Heaven forbid if we every time the news media made a statement about us that we would start they start investigating us. We wouldn't be here. Several of us wouldn't be. So I just, I, I don't want us to make a, a decision based on innuendos and information that has been back, that has been properly vetted. Yes, some of it has, but not all of it. So why should we, but all of it's been brought up. So why should we uh, try to destroy someone that's been a very valuable asset to the Metro government? And if you look back at some of the cost uh, uh, variations between them and others, uh, you can see where they have uh, actually, uh, we, Metro government has benefited on several occasions by their work, uh, selection of them in the process. So I, I just want, I just want, I'm pleading with our members of this uh, committee to use your, I mean, think about what we're doing here that, uh, and why this has come up and why this amendment is here. This is not the amendment from the, from the sponsor of the original bill, original resolution. So I just ask that to uh, use the same thought process that if it was you that had been named in a, in a news article about committing something without being properly vetted. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Pratmore. Director Lane, I don't, I don't know if you're the, the appropriate body, but um, as it relates to the, the engineering firm in question, are they still, I believe they're still undergoing investigation, so there is still a process that hasn't been finalized yet. I just think that's important for the viewing, the viewing audience to know that um, the, the process isn't, isn't finalized yet, that investigation is still uh, ongoing. That is correct. Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Jamison. Uh, and actually, Chair, I'm sorry, I probably jumped ahead of myself on the, the question I thought I wanted to ask. We're on the amendment. I don't want to get out of line on this. Um, if, if we need to ask about the amendment, I'm fine with that. I want to ask the procedure after the, the amendment vote, and I would like to be recognized to talk about a timeline of perhaps what might be appropriate. So I, I want to be very cautious not to ask the wrong questions. I want to be, I want to value everyone's time. So <clears throat> my, my question probably is not specific to the amendment. And when I pushed my button, I kind of thought it was, but I made a mistake. So if you'd like, we'll vote on the amendment. Then if you wouldn't mind, Chair, I would like to come back and talk about a timeline. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Glover. Councilman Pulley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Councilman Pride more covered uh, one of the things. I agree that, uh, it, that ba basing any a decision on a news media report is is a little bit irresponsible of us. I'm, uh, I, you know, I think it's very important for us to uh, scrutinize, and it's very important for due process to occur during this scrutinization. So I think I'd much rather deal in facts. I have a couple of questions, uh, one of which was already answered uh, that. There is still an ongoing review. Um, uh, so my I, I probably should direct this at, uh, Mr. to Mr. Jamison. Uh, if we were to approve this list, 
and the ongoing review turns up things that uh, are evidentiary in nature and cause us uh, great concern and consternation on the council and we should make a decision at that point in time after this master list is, a, uh, is approved uh, to, as a council, uh, is there anything we can do to affect that list beyond, uh, uh, beyond what we're doing now? Well, assuming I'm speaking hypothetically to your uh, scenario, if, if the purchasing agent were to determine uh, a reasonable basis for suspic suspecting fraudulent billing activity or some other uh, inappropriate invoicing, um, the code really leaves it to the purchasing agent to take the, uh, the remedial efforts, uh, be it suspension of the firm, which uh, given due call she can do for a period of three months, uh, but eventually leading to uh, debarment, uh, completely uh, eliminating the contractor from its ability to do business with the metropolitan government. Um, because of the nature of, of the pur purchasing agents um, under the code being essentially the express agent for enforcing suspensions and debarments, um, the council, uh, to my knowledge, has not taken uh, similar actions to, to direct the pur purchasing agent in that, in that regard. Um, this particular amendment, um, this particular ordinance is essentially updating an existing list on which Collier's um, currently uh, exists and essentially would preclude the provision of, of updated information. But again, assuming the purchasing agent were to determine a reasonable basis for suspecting inappropriate uh, invoicing or other inappropriate or illegal activity, she has the ability to take the corrective remedial action alone. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I certainly am in favor of allowing what scrutiny is uh, ongoing to continue, and, uh, and I'm much more comfortable basing uh, any decision or, or that I would have relating to this on evidence, and I, I don't believe we have enough of that right now to make that determination. I have full confidence in the purchasing agent uh, that they will handle this appropriately. So for that reason, I'm not in support of this amendment. Thank you, Councilman Pulley. Councilman Pridemore, will you seek an addi additional? Yes, ma'am, I apologize. Um, I covered this earlier, but uh, uh, Councilman Pulley brought up something. Well, the statement was made from uh, Councilman, I mean, Mr. Jameson. Um, if the purchasing agent has the authority, did you say, to scrutinize any of the in vendors in that? Uh, well, I, I would like to ask her, have any other uh, purchasing aid, I mean, any other aid, uh, vendor has been scrutinized lately? Scrutinized in a way as it results or as it relates, I'm sorry, to their inclusion, say, on a master list? Or has been scrutinized either by media, response, media uh, reports or by any accusations that they needed to be uh, audited or by you, uh, that you felt, because you actually have the authority to do that. Not, not to this extent. I mean, not beyond the, the normal course of contract management kinds of issues. So Collier's the only one? That I'm aware of. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman Pridemore. And just so that the, the committee is aware, um, I have requested an audit for, for other firms. So it's not just, it's not just, just Collier. Councilman Glover. <laughs> So because of the last question, I was going to try and wait until the actual bill, but I'm going to have to do it now. Can we please get uh, before tomorrow the percentage of business that Collier actually gets from the city and who else they compete against and what percentage, you know, they get as well? Uh, I, I really was trying to wait, Chair, but uh, based on the last question and things that were brought up, I think that's relevant. Thank you. Director Lane, will you be able to provide that? Uh, may I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Are, are you requesting the percentage of all architecture and engineering business that they receive or the percentage of all business? Councilman Glover. I think, Mr. Jamison, uh, I'm going to ask, uh, based on this, if I may, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to answer you. I just want to make sure I do it correctly. Forgive me, Chair. Based on the amendment here, um, 
is that a relevant question on not 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 this is a relevant question should i do the architectural or should should i do as a whole uh based on the meaning of the uh, amendment so what the resolution is doing is approving collier's architectural addition uh, uh what i would assume that means is that their work has been previously engineering but what you could ask Ms. Lane to do is to provide to you the percentage of engineering work let by the Metropolitan Government that Collier's has received since the institution of their contract. And then, I guess, in an abundance of caution, have the, if they've done any architectural work uh, prior to entry on the list, uh, that percentage as well. Okay, Chair. So, uh, again, I'm trying not to waste any more time on this. Uh, based on what uh, you've you've said, Mr. Jamison, if they can provide information tomorrow on that specific, uh, and again, Chair, forgive me, but when when the last question was brought up or the last comment was brought up, I felt like I, I wanted to make sure I understood it. So, uh, thank you for indulging me, and I will wait until we get on the actual bill. Thank, thank you. you, Councilman Glover. Director Lane, did you um, and can you please uh, for that? Uh, that information to the commit well to all council members um, through Mr. Jameson. Councilwoman Henderson. Thank you, Chair Virtue. I just wanted to take the opportunity to follow up um, on the comments of Councilman Pridemore and Councilman Pulley um, to make sure that it's very clear. Um, Councilman Pridemore used a very strong word: destroy. That's inappropriate. Okay, what we are talking about here is not tacitly approving the expansion of the work product that Collier Engineering is allowed to bid for. They're still on the list, okay? We are removing them. What I am proposing is to remove them from this amendment to the master list. So given that they are under internal audit, this isn't just about accusations in news stories, respectfully, colleagues. They are subject of an internal audit. Our compliance officer has sent a letter to Ms. Hernandez Lane that says, we have information indicating that incorrect and inappropriate billing to Metro Public Works by Collier Engineering Co. Inc. may have occurred. Collier Engineering has also been found by the internal auditor to have engaged in conduct that violates the ethical standards in procurement. Our chief compliance officer is saying that Collier has violated ethical standards in procurement. Why then, as a council, are we trying so hard to make sure that we can then expand the capacity of Collier to work? with our city, okay? They remain on the list through this amendment. This amendment merely says that we are not going to tacitly approve kind of re-upping them to expand the scope of the work that they can bid for in this city. I think at a minimum, colleagues, that's what we should do given the internal audit, given the letter of uh, the uh, chief compliance officer, and respectfully, the uh, indications in the news me media are from Freedom of Information requests wherein Collier has misbilled this city egregiously. Additionally, I haven't even read the news article, but apparently now the mayor's office is in, in touch with the state comptroller as it relates to Collier. So how does it look if this, if this council is trying so hard to advance something to the benefit of Collier at this juncture. So colleagues, this is the simplest path for addressing this. If this amendment doesn't pass, I've got a whole nother resolution and we can address this and we can really get into this further. But this amendment is the best way to address this at this time. It effectively maintains status quo for Collier and does not, uh, it, it, have us expanding what they can um, apply for. I certainly hope that, and Councilman or Mr. Jamison alluded to, I hope that you know the Russian concern is not because Collier is already in this architecture space with Metro, because that would not be appropriate. So if they're not already in that space, what's the concern 
And um, I, I would invite colleagues, please, let's, I mean, let's, let's do what is appropriate at this juncture. Councilman Pridemore's assertion that this destroys this firm is inaccurate and inappropriate, respectfully. And so I would ask, please, that you support this amendment. Thank you, Councilwoman Henderson. Councilman Pridemore. Thank you, Madam Chair. And since I was addressed by my name, I will respond by that. I Floor tried, is yours. Try to avoid that. Council Lady Henderson made the statement that uh, I said destroyed uh, future. That's just correct. I stand by that. They have been singled out, obviously singled out. No other firm has been scrutinized, yes, by allegations, and, and there are some that have been, one, that's been sub, uh, substantiated, but again, we all know the caliber of, of what, what, the, what took place. All I'm asking for is due process. My God, this is the United States of America. Are we going to eliminate somebody? And I know the list. I, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll calm down. I'm, I know the list and, and what... It, it, that they're going to remain on the list, but I also know what a censored list is, and that's exactly what that is, Madam Chair and Council Lady Henderson. It is a censored list singling out one particular firm. Now, if we're going to do this right, investigate it, and vet it, completely vet it out, go through the process, and if it's if the information comes that when it's concluded and they still feel the same way, we feel the same way, or, or the, the uh, um, purchasing agent feels the same way, so be it. By the way, she has the right to do it without our consent. So if she feels that strongly about it, then she do it. Why is, she, why is this amendment even here? I want to thank, uh, thank you again, Madam Chair, and thank you respectfully, Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Councilman Pridemore. Councilwoman Dow. I was just going to say that, that I'm not going to support it either. I think we should. We don't know what the other firms are doing. And I really appreciate that you're moving forward with ordering the audit to look at all the different ones so we can get a good assessment of what the process is, uh, what type of conduct is happening. I served on the audit committee uh, last term for four years. And I think it's best to just get full information. So I'm not disagreeing with uh, Council Lady Henderson, but I do believe in um, allowing all the facts and the information to come out so that we can make a decision so that I ask that we uh, do not support this. Let's move forward, get the information, and then make our decisions from there when we can look at every firm on that list. And I think, um, um, you know, I will say this, is that I do believe that they have been somewhat pulled out and picked out. Uh, God, uh, uh, they do a great job in their engineering work, and it shouldn't be conflicted with some other practices there. So I think we, the practices that's happening with the city should not be uh, overshadowed of the work that they do. We just need to get all the information. And if the information that comes from the audit substantiates uh, what uh, we believe, then we can make an uh, assessment and a determination then of how to move forward. So I ask that we just move forward with not supporting this, and let's get on through the agenda. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Dow. Vice Chair Roten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, someone from the administration, if you could answer, do you know, we're looking into Collier, do you know when we might get an answer back on what we find? Attorney Cooper? So Patsy Cottrell, the Chief Compliance Officer, sent a letter to the Comptroller Friday afternoon um, there is a provision in state law that if there is a, um, uh, if you receive information, information that could reasonably lead someone to believe there had been uh, unlawful activity, which is a defined term in the state law, uh, then you have a, a mandatory obligation to report that to the comptroller. Uh, the mayor consulted with me. Um, it, we came to the conclusion that based on the, the um, information that had been provided, then we had the obligation to inform the comptroller. I have no idea what process they will go through or, or if they will um, look into it. Uh, that's really beyond our control. We've done what we felt like we um, had to do under state law, and so um, it, it is with Collier, I mean with um, the comptroller. Set, on a kind of a parallel track, 
the finance department and the purchasing agent are reviewing all of Collier's contracts and the billing to determine if there are any irregularities. And so that, that is underway now. Thank you. Um, Mr. Jameson, it's been six years since we've updated this list. Is there gonna be any harm in waiting another month, two months, three months to just kind of see what we find out about Collier or anybody else that might be out there being investigated, then we can update the list? I would suspect not, but I would probably suggest that Ms. Lane has a better answer to that than I do. Director Lane. Um, there, there are new firms that are proposed to be added to the list um, that could directly impact pending uh, procurement activity. So to the extent that those firms would not be added and therefore would not be available for selection um, and that could potentially, would potentially uh, directly impact an open solicitation, there is that potential harm. Have we not added anybody to the list for the last six years? Not to my knowledge. And we've done okay without adding anybody to the list? I mean, not to my knowledge, we've, you know, we've not added anyone, but I am expressing directly to you that it would have an impact on a current solicitation. Or it could potentially have an impact on a current solicitation. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm gonna make a motion to defer this for two meetings so we can get a list of what this will impact and how much it will impact it to see if we can delay the implementation of this new list until we find out something about the entities being investigated. Okay, it's a proper motion for deferral for two meetings and it's been properly seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Councilman Glover. So, Mr. Jamison, I want to make sure, we are we only deferring the amendment, or are we deferring everything? There is a motion for the resolution. Yeah, I'm, but, but I'm just trying to make sure I understand what we're going to do. Right. We were on the amendment, but Councilman Roten uh, submitted a motion to defer, which takes precedence, so the resolution... No, that, that's fine. I just want to make sure I understand. Okay, then please, uh, uh, then I'm a yes on deferral. Thank you. We've, all, we've already voted. Well, okay. I just want to make sure uh, Councilman Bentney. Yeah, I pushed the button. I'm, I know I'm not on the committee, but I'm the only with the background of architecture, and I wanted to share what I knew about this, and now I won't get to speak, so... I was just hoping that in the future, if you can uh, let me speak, even if I'm not a committee member, uh, to share what I know about the particular issue. Thank you, Councilman Batney. Our committee, we recognize committee members first. You'll have two weeks uh, if you want to comment then. Councilwoman Gilmore, are you seeking recognition? Thank you, Chair. I did have my mind pushed. It's just a long, you, we were on the amendment. Councilman Roten made a motion to defer, which takes precedent. Okay. Well, you can go ahead. All right, just, I just wanna be clear that mine was pushed. So um, I did have a question, but I don't even know if it's relevant now because we've moved on, but I was, I was wanting to ask if there are interim measures that we could take as it related to this versus just deferring the bill completely. Um, it's all, we've already voted. Yeah, like I said, I thought it. Councilwoman Henderson. Okay, we are on RS 2019-1570. Sponsors, Mendez, Virtue, and others. Thank you, Director Lane. Declare surplus certain property to the Housing Fund, Inc. for the Nashville Community Land Trust. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion, I'll go to the sponsor, Councilman Mendez. Thanks. Um, I did want to uh, ask Ms. Ladd some questions, um, just because this is a, a new process for us. Um, so we, uh, city has set up a community land trust, um, which uh, the idea is that um, uh, property, surplus properties get set aside for future use for affordable housing. And uh, I'm just trying to anticipate some of the questions colleagues might have. I wanted to just uh, ask Ms. Ladd a few. First of all, is the city's regular surplus process been followed for all these properties? Yes, it has. And um, then the idea, as I understand it, is that uh, um, any affordable housing will be uh, permanently affordable, not what we're used to with uh, 
TIF or other programs where it might be 5, 10, 15 years of affordability? That's correct. The land trust model offers permanent affordability. And um, the idea is that it would be serving um, uh, residents that are at 80% of area media income or, and below. And um, I understand there's a, a process in place for any units that are owned um, that there would be what's called a shared equity model where um, the resident would be incentivized to get some of the upside if they sell for a higher price than they got it, but um, that they wouldn't get the full value in order to help protect the affordability? That's correct. And, th and then I guess uh, one thing that I I've heard from some people is wanting to make sure that um, affordable units don't end up being um, uh, like little mini short-term rental hotels. Um, and, uh, and I guess I understand those won't be allowed in, in properties that go through the community land trust. That's right. I do have, there are um, two folks here from the housing fund, which is the entity that is um, incubating the community land trust. They can speak to the specifics about the regulations for homeowners um, with, as it pertains to how long, you know, their residency in any short-term, uh, right, prohibi prohibitions around short-term rentals. That would be great if we could hear from them. Thank you. Can we have the representatives come up? Thank you for being so patient with us. We have a full agenda this evening. No problem, and good evening. Um, Marshall Crawford with the Housing Fund, President and CEO, and our recently hired CLT manager, Dominic Anderson. Um, in speaking to your question, um, Councilman, um, the, all properties will go through a ground lease process. So anybody who owns a ground lease on that, um, anything that they do with that property, they have to come back to the housing fund. We will provide stewardship over those properties. Um, those individuals will not own the land, but they will own the structures and they still, any amendments or any changes to those structures, they still have to come back through the housing fund for any, um, any changes that they are willing to make on it. And, and then uh, what about uh, the short-term rentals? Yes, so that's the same thing on a short-term. No short-term rentals are permitted in the ground lease as indicated. Individuals have to live in their units for a minimum of nine months. They have to be in there for nine months. Any changes that they make on that, they also have to come back. If they want to sublet that to us or to anybody else, they would have to come back to us and get approval. If there is a sublease that is put on it, then we will get a lease agreement and we will bring that back before the Barnes Commission and letting them know of anything that for their approval on that. All right, uh, thanks. And um, just before I uh, uh, put the mic down, I want to make sure to thank the Barnes Fund and Ms. Ladd and Mr. Crawford. Um, uh, Community Land Trust um, is, a, is a big deal, and, and a lot of um, advocates in the community have been looking for this for a while. And as far as the ability for the city to be able to take surplus property rather than selling it as a one-time asset to make budgets meet, um, uh, Keeping it for our future um, is is a big deal and appreciate all your hard work in making it come together. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Councilwoman Allen Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to echo what Councilmember Mendez says and also ask if you can speak just real briefly about the s Support and financial literacy and other uh, services that y'all provide typically as part of the community land trust package Absolutely, and thank you what we've been trying to do is um, operationalize for, there are 258 community land trusts around the country, and most community land trusts are known as developers. So they, they get donated property and they develop it and keep it in perpetuity. For the housing fund, it, right now it is a program. And it's a program for the simple fact that we're trying to determine um, its sustainability. Um, in that process and hiring, the resources that we got from the mayor's office was to um, provide support and operationalizing, hiring a, a CLT manager, and providing educational materials. So we're in the process of developing educational materials, not only for the communities that these properties are located in, but also for developers and partners. Um, lenders are going to play a critical role in this as well. Um, we have Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac who are also interested in being partners with us. Um, we have resources. So we are doing everything that we need to do to develop those materials to make sure that we're educating the community uh, um, on this process and what the Community Land Trust has to offer. Great. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilwoman Allen. Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. Well, I'm gonna sound like the meanie that a lot of people think I am. <laughs> if we give 10 million per year for buying property, for doing various things, is this gonna be on top of that? So we've already given them $10 million uh, to utilize in the budget, in the operational budget. And so now if we pass this, then is that on top of, or would it come off of the 10 million we've allocated? It's Director Lomax over there. Oh, I see her. Uh, uh, Councilman, this one does not appropriate additional funding. It, this, this is uh, being taken care of from uh, allocations that have already been approved by this body. Okay, so I, I guess I'm just trying to, because that was the thing that was, I was trying to figure out on the surplusing of it, I still think I go back, if they take the land that has been quote surplused, um, and, and I, now I'm gonna go back to the fairgrounds because once again, I'm a meanie, remember? We, we surplused uh, land at the fairgrounds, did we do that for that piece of property? So I'm trying to understand exactly how this works. If, if, and forgive me, I just don't quite get it. I mean, we're, we're putting money in and we're um, doing the things you just said. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make two and two equal four and I'm having a hard time. I, I understand, Councilman. Uh, the piece that I can assure you on is that this does not require an additional appropriation. Audra is more well-versed on the process that they use to do these allocations. So if you don't mind me deferring that piece to her. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilman. Um, the Barnes funding of 10 million is a, as you know, is an operational transfer that uh, is competitively for people, uh, nonprofit developers competitively send in applications for that. In addition to the 10 million, they can request um, property that is in our current back tax portfolio. So that property that um, was offered on the courthouse steps, no one purchased it, it comes into our back tax portfolio, then that, that portfolio gets evaluated by planning and codes as to whether those lots are buildable. Some of them are not, some of them are. If they're buildable, then first priority goes to um, the developer, development of affordable housing through the Barnes Fund. So it goes back tax, evaluation through the Barnes Fund to folks like the Housing Fund for the CLT, and other affordable housing purposes. Okay, so given the fact that the land was surplused at the fairgrounds, uh, is this gonna be a part of that? No, no, this is a separate, a totally separate process. Uh, help me understand why. This is back, this is back tax property. This Not, is only back tax yes, property, sir. oh, okay. Yes, sir. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Glover. Seeing no more discussion, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? We're gonna need a show of hands, all in favor? Opposed? Resolution is recommended. We're on RS 2019-1571, sponsors Mendez, Vircher, and others, approves amendments to contracts for constructing affordable housing between the Metro Housing Trust Fund Commission, Urban Housing Solutions, Dismas, and Woodbine Community Organization. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Uh, Councilman Mendez, do you want to speak to this as a sponsor? I would love to ask uh, Ms. Ladd to describe what this one does. Ms. Ladd. So this um, allows a little more time for three Barnes recipients to finish the projects that they have underway. Um, the original contracts were for 24 months. Some of these folks due to construction timelines or due to some issues with transferring of property or title um, had uh, some delays in the schedule. So this would allow them to um, stay, extend their contracts so they can perform. Does that answer? Um, uh, yes, and I, I just want to add that, uh, so this would be an extension from the first round of uh, Barnes funding that from, was done? From Barnes round three, the third round. Okay. Um, and the I know the, the hiccups in transferring title, 
that, that's been theoretically ironed out now for future rounds? Most of that has been ironed out in the terms of our internal process for transferring the tax. There still can be cloudy title issues once the folks receive the property. We're working on addressing that second part as well for the next round of Barnes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ladd. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019 1572 sponsors Roten, Syracuse, and others improves an option agreement between Metro and Charlie R. Smith and Marlene J. Smith and authorizes the purchase of properties owned by the Smiths. Is, is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019 1573 sponsors Virtue and Syracuse, approves a grant from the Tennessee State Library and Archives to the Nashville Public Library to purchase computers for use by library patrons and staff to enhance the use of technology services available at the public library. Is there a motion? Aye. It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion, all in favor? Opposed? Resolution is recommended. If there aren't any objections, I would like to take RS 2019, 1574, and 1575 together. Are there any objections? Seeing none, RS 2019, 1574, sponsors Virtue, Betney, and O'Connell, authorizes the Director of Public Property to exercise an option agreement for the purchase of flood-prone property located at Zero Rifle Range Road for Metro Water Services. RS 2019, 1575, sponsors Virtue Betney O'Connell, authorizes the Director of Public Property to exercise option agreements for the purchase of various flood-prone properties for Metro Water Services. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion, all in favor? Opposed? Resolutions are recommended. RS 2019 1576 sponsors Virtue and Freeman, approves a contract between the Metro and NEC Corporation of America to provide AFIS, AFIS system software maintenance and support. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion, all in favor? Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019 1577 sponsors Virtue Freeman Gilmore approves an application for a grant from the Tennessee Highland Realm Healthcare Coalition to the Nashville Fire Department for a utility trailer to rapidly transport and deploy cash medical supplies and equipment. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion, all in favor? Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019 1578 sponsors Virtue. Freeman and Gilmore approves a grant from the Tennessee Highland Realm Healthcare Coalition to the Metro Nashville Fire Department for a, for a utility trailer to rapidly transport and deploy cash medical supplies and equipment. Is that a duplicate resolution? No, one's an application. Okay, got it. The application and, the, and approves the grant. Okay. It's, it's moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Resolution is recommended. If there isn't any objection, I would like to take RS 2019, 1579, 1580, and 1581 together. Seeing no objections. RS 2019, 1579, sponsor Virtue authorizes the Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of Tyler J. Ivory against Metro government in the amount of $13,500. RS 2019, 1580, sponsor Virtue authorizes the Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of Andrea Crenshaw against Metro in the amount of $30,000. RS 2019, 1581, sponsor Virtue authorizes the Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of Patricia Rose against the Metro government in the amount of $12,500. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Resolutions are recommended. RS 2019, 1582, sponsors Virtue and Betney approves an amendment to a grant from the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency to the Department of Finance to provide public assistance to complete repairs and or replacement to facilities damaged during April and May 2010. Is there a motion? 
It's been moved and properly seconded. See no discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019-1583, sponsors Vircher Gilmore, approves a grant from Boulevard Bolt, Inc. to Metro Government for the use and benefit of the Metro Nashville Social Services Commission to benefit the House Nashville program to aid homelessness. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019-1584 sponsors Virtue Gilmore approves a grant from the Association of Food and Drug Officials to the Metro Board of Health to fund travel expenses for health department staff to attend food environmentalist training. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019-1585 sponsors Virtue Gilmore approves a grant from the Association of Food and Drug Officials to the Metro Board of Health to provide funding for staff members to attend the FDA Southeast Regional Seminar. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019-1586 sponsors Virtue and Gilmore approves an amendment to a grant from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to the Metro Board of Health to fund an ongoing program to protect air quality to achieve established ambient air standards and protect human health. The Sarah's motion. It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019-1587 sponsors Virtue and Gilmore approves an amendment to a contract with Vanderbilt University Medical Center and the Metro Board of Health to, to participate as a member site in the Centers for Disease Control, Tuberculosis, Epidemiologic Studies, Consortium Studies. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019 1588 sponsors Virtue Gilmore approves an amendment to a grant from the Tennessee Department of Health to the Metro Board of Health to provide oral disease prevention services for school children in ages K 8 in qualifying public schools. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019-1591 sponsors Virtue and O'Connell approves a curbside recycling grant from the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation to the Metro Nashville Public Works Department to fund the purchase of curbside recycling equipment. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion. Oh, we do. Councilwoman Henderson. Um, Chair Virtue, could I just inquire, please, about this uh, grant? Absolutely. Do we have someone here for Public Works? Oh, she's coming down. Yes, Sharon Smith from Public Works. Hey, Sharon, can you hey. speak to this grant, please, um, the amount and specifically how it's going to be uh, utilized, please? Yes. So this is a grant that we got from the uh, state of Tennessee. It is for two, just shy of $2.4 million dollars and it will be used to offset part of the uh, equipment cost to go from once a month curbside recycling collection to every other week curbside recycling collection. Okay, so it requires a cash match then? Yes, ma'am. So um, from a budgetary perspective, where is that going to be coming from? Okay, so we also have um, upcoming another $250 grant that uh, we'll be bringing to the council in the coming uh, weeks. 250000 or yes. 200000 okay. 250000 and a, um, another application that's still out there that we haven't heard back yet on for $590,000. Um, this year there was a um, $1.5 million uh, budget amount put in for capital purchases. So we're trying to make up as much of that difference as possible. So this council then approved $1.5 million towards this effort, um, but you require a cash match of 2.3. So you are seeking grant funding of $750,000. To, to make up that difference. To yeah. make up that difference. Now uh, the only the only issue is we know we'll get the 250. We're not sure about the the rest, so that would be the only um, differences we may need a little more money. But I'm very positive about these grants. Okay, thank you, mm -hmm. Councilwoman Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Smith, could I just get you to talk about how this fits into the zero waste master plan and what 
what impact this can have on moving us closer to that goal. Well, absolutely, because a once a month curbside recycling program, I, I believe we're actually the only city in the United States that has a, um, a program so infrequent. And it's difficult for residents to build a habit around. Once it goes every other week, it becomes easier. People don't struggle to remember when to set their card out. And it also in usually increases participation and tonnage. And of course, um, everybody knows about the Rutherford, uh, the landfill in Rutherford County that will be closing. And the more uh, of the, the material that we are landfilling that we can divert to recycling, the more it's going to save us down the road. So this is an important piece to offer our uh, residents uh, that, that whose property taxes cover this, a more frequent and reliable um, curbside recycling program. Thank you. Councilwoman Henderson. If I may, Chair Bircher, just one more question. Ms. Smith, I know y'all did a fairly small uh, audit um, that said most of our recycle stream was, uh, or not most of it, but the primary corruption of our stream was uh, plastic bags. Yes. So internal to their home, people put recyclables in sort of a plastic grocery store bag, and then they dump that into their cart. Um, can you speak to what we are going to do from a prominent visibility standpoint, whether by sticker or embedded on the actual lid? I mean, what are we doing in that regard? Because, you know, fine, we've got more tonnage, but if the tonnage is, you it's know, trash, yeah. is, is trash, I mean, so can you speak to how with the ex expansion you're likewise going to address that problem, please? Yes, that's a great question. We've already started trying to address that uh, by updated decals that go on the carts. And we do, with our new recycling carts, have what's called an in-mold label. So it's, it's on there. But in addition to that, we've started uh, route audits, and we're trying to chip away at it. So we have somebody who drives around before the trucks. And of course, it's one person, so he can only do one route uh, a day, but he's out there you know, every day. And putting tags on the carts, they're little oop stickers that explains why their recycling wasn't emptied. Mm -hmm. So somebody comes home, they see that sticker, they lift the lid, they call in, and we're getting the address from the gentleman and entering it into the hub. So when they call in, we can tell them, oh, you, you know, bagged all your recyclables. As soon as you resolve that, we'll come back out and pick it up. So that's kind of a, a slow part of the process. But in addition, we're going to be getting some money specifically for education around every other week recycling. And you're absolutely right. One of the most important things we have to do is to, to, to not just teach people to put stuff in a green recycling cart, but to teach people how to recycle right so that we don't end up with, you know, a lot of good recyclables in plastic bags that don't get recycled. So then from a budget and finance perspective, because I think we as council members often hear, and you've seen kind of in national media, um, and I know it varies depending if you're on the West Coast or otherwise, and kind of, you know, where does the recycling go? And so there's been somewhat of a narrative that, you know, this is kind of a, a loss for cities. Um, I know that is true specific to glass recycling, um, but can you speak to, from a budget and finance perspective, us expanding the recycling, having the program that we do, what is the kind of the, the, the cost benefit analysis for us um, as it relates to landfilling, but also, um, you know, are we, are we breaking even on this, so to speak? Oh. I mean, from the beginning of the recycling program, we've never broken even. Recycling is always going to have a cost associated with it, but it also has a cost avoidance by not having the additional landfill tipping fees. I think our big challenge going forward is going to be to really educate people about what can go in the cart, even though we've all heard about China and, you know, they don't want to get American recyclables, but any country and any recycler will take clean recycling clean recyclables. And so our goal is to get it as the recycling stream as clean as possible so that we don't have some of these barriers that have impacted, you know, cities all over the country. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilwoman Henderson. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019-1592 sponsors Virtue Gil Gilmore O'Connell approves a grant for a recycling rebate from the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation to the Department of Public Works to fund recycling education and the purchase of curbside recycling carts. Is there a motion? 
It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion, all in favor? Opposed? Resolution is recommended. RS 2019-1593 sponsors Virtue Freeman and others approves an agreement between the United States Department of the Army and the Metro Department of Water and Sewage Services for the Seven Mile Creek Flood Risk Management Project. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion, all in favor? Opposed? <coughs> Resolution is recommended. RS 2019-1594 sponsors Virtual O'Connell approves a grant from the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation to the Metro Nashville Water and Sewage Services Department to replace 130 broken and missing tree grates with flexible porous paving. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Councilwoman Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've seen these in other cities and it looks like a really great idea to help the trees and the sidewalks coexist peacefully. One question I had though, was that, it, I mean, if I'm doing the math right, it looks like that's about $1,300 per, per mat. Can anybody speak to that, the economics of it? We have uh, Mr. Palco here. Hello, Tom Palco, Metro Water. Yeah, that's, that's about right. I mean, and, but these things will last probably 10 years. And so what we have now is you have metal grates that are kind of choking the trees down and they're tripping hazards and you have to go in so often and cut the metal out and reform them and it never never fits smoothly. This is stuff you go in, it's recycled tires, you crush them up, the water goes in, it's smooth all around, it eliminates a lot of the tripping hazard and everything else. And, and again, if we have to come back every 10 or 15 years or so and redo them again, I, I, we think it's, it's money well spent. Okay, I mean, I, 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 like I say, I've seen them in other cities and it does seem to work better than the metal grates, so I'm glad we're moving to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Allen. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Uh, opposed? Resolution is recommended. Ready? Okay. Now we're on to, I believe we have a late file resolution by Councilwoman Henderson. Are you gonna offer that late file resolution, Councilwoman Henderson? Can you uh, press your button for me? You're on. Thank you, Chair Bircher. Um, uh Mr. Jameson, can you uh, speak to procedurally, do I have to um, introduce this here or uh, may I do that in rules tomorrow and address this at tomorrow's meeting or procedurally, what do I need to do? You should have a committee recommendation and I believe the clerk's office which assigns legislation to committees is assigned it to both this committee as well as public works. So as long as you have consideration and recommendation from either committee, you can proceed tomorrow. Okay, I'm going to wait and move this in public works committee, please. Okay, thank you so much, Councilwoman Henderson. Councilman Glover. So I, I, I would like to make sure I understand procedurally what is being requested. If we don't make a recommendation, um, and uh, I, I'm not, I don't understand what uh, what exactly it says. Obviously, it's late filed. But if we don't make a re recommendation, does it create a roadblock for the council member tomorrow night, or does it not? As long as she has a recommendation from the Public Works Committee or a committee, she can proceed on the floor tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Glover. Now we're on bills on second reading. I'll stop it, Councilman Sledge, it ain't been that long. We're on BL 2018-1439. Uh, sponsor, Councilman Sledge, amends the Metro Code to authorize the Metro Housing Trust Fund Commission to rescind grant contracts and collect funds previously allocated to ag organizations that fail to execute contractual obligations in a timely manner. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Councilwoman Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to ask the sponsor if he could talk about um, what happens if they have begun the contracts, they're just not quite done with it. I will go to the sponsor, Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll probably rely on Audrey a little bit on this one as well. This bill was out of some discussion that we were having regarding the fact that we have contracts, one of which you recommended approval, or some of which you recommended approval to extend earlier tonight um, that have sort of different terms as far as uh, length of contract and performance. And so we were finding as a commission that we needed to maybe standardize some of that. So that was where this bill came. From Councilor Allen's question, I'll turn to Audra as far as 
the language that we had within this bill, I think we were indicating that how you perform on the contract and performance of the contract would be indicated in the contract between those two parties. Is that accurate? And I may look at Mike. That is correct. Oh, okay. So that would be the definition as, as defined in the contract on performing. Councilwoman Allen, did that? Okay. Councilman Glover. Just very quickly, uh, Mr. Jamison, uh, and, and I'll, I'll admit, I don't fully understand the complexity of this particular bill. If when we get in a little deeper, and I realize we're in the committee now asking questions, et cetera, uh, if over the next two weeks something uh, doesn't seem quite right, is this still amendable on third or is it not? This would not fall under the general nature of um, under Rule 15 that the, those bills that can be amended on third, zoning, tax bills, uh, economic incentive. So I would suspect it cannot be amended on third reading. Okay. So, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm just going to ask the sponsor if he wouldn't mind. I would appreciate it. Please explain that one more time. I tried to read the analysis and I tried to understand what we were trying to accomplish here. And I'll be the first one to admit I didn't do a very good job of that. That's okay, Councilman Glover. Uh, Councilman Sledge. Sure. So in the contracts that we have that the commission issues every, uh, well, every funding round, essentially, um, we were finding that the contract lengths tend to vary. It might have been a month or two, but they tended to vary. And then we were also finding that there was a varying degree of performance on those contracts. You might see a contract where somebody was able to get to work and uh, worked immediately and was performing and then was drawing upon those funds. Then there were some where it didn't appear that that was occurring. Um, and so the commission is trying to work to see, okay, if they're, uh, and in this bill it says 24 months, if there's no performance on the contract in 24 months, that the commission has the ability, it doesn't trigger anything immediate, but the commission has the ability to say, okay, we need to take a closer look here, and if it doesn't appear that this grantee is going to be able to perform, um, that the commission would have the option to then do that, well, what I'm calling a clawback, to do a clawback, then put that money back into the Barnes Fund and say, let's reallocate this on our next funding round. So that's, that's the intention here. Um, and again, it's an authorization. It doesn't say you hit some trigger and boom, the money goes away. It says that the commission's able to work with the city, work with the applicant, and see what the situation might be. Councilor so, Glover. Yeah, just uh, I want to make sure I make sure I understand the uh, clarification on the timeline. The 24 months would begin after third reading. It, it's not retroactive. Is that correct, Madam Chair? Councilman Sledge. I, I believe that's correct, and I'm going to look at Mike just to make sure. That's correct. Okay, so, okay, I, th thank you, because that I was trying to understand timelines and, and exactly how it worked. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Glover. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Opposed? Bill is recommended. If there aren't any objections, I'd like to take BL 2019-1476, 1477, 1478, 1479 together, if there aren't any objections. Move. Seeing none, we're on BL 2019, 1476. Sponsors, Vircher, Glover, Betney, declare surplus and approves the, dip, the, dis, the disposition of property known as Zero Brick Church Pike. BL 2019, 1477. Sponsors, Roten, Vircher, and others, declare surplus and approves the disposition of property known as 3125 Ironwood Drive. BL 2019 1478 sponsors Wiener, Betney, and others. There is a letter from the sponsor for approval. Declare surplus and approves the, dis the disposition of property known as 1015 Davison Road. BL 2019 1479 sponsors Syracuse, Vircher, and others declare surplus and, and approves the disposition of property known as 2795 Pennington Bend. Is there a motion? Okay. It's been moved and properly seconded, and we have discussion. Councilman Cooper at large. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, particularly on 1476. Um, I've received a lot of emails about this. How public has the process been at this point? Has there been a hearing or has there any been any public forum that 
uh, neighbors can express their opinion. Do we have some um, one over the? Well, I was just going to okay. point out that um, we have representatives from schools, from MMPS. They could speak to the. Oh, they're here. I see. Uh, board process, up to this point. Mr. Thanks. North, I didn't see you back there. Thank you, Mark North, Metro Schools. Uh, it, these went through the usual school board process uh, and were uh, discussed through the budget committee, uh, and then at, at an open. Uh, school board meeting uh, there were and there's always of course public participation available at, at uh, the first meeting of the uh, of the month uh, at the school board um, thank you mark always a pleasure to see you if you didn't mind keeping tally for us I know we've passed an ordinance not allowing us to do this anymore, but in terms of one-time property sales to balance the budget, and then if you would just refresh us on what portion schools is expected to produce and what are the totals after these sales uh, should they happen. All right, I don't have the, okay, so the, the current year budget, uh, uh, expected sale of real property to fund $13 million to provide the revenue for, of $13 million for the schools. Um, these four properties were surplused by the school board, uh, which means they don't uh, need them now and don't foresee needing them in the future. I don't have the amounts right in front of me uh, or to add them up in my head. Uh, Mr. Harmon might, might be able to help, but I believe it is uh, totals eight, five million. No, it's uh, it's total? five four. It's a little shy of five four. So a based over, on the appraised value, five million dollars uh, is the total of these these four properties. If if they were to uh, get what they're appraised for, if the, if they it get, would be five point right, four million dollars. That's what they're appraised for. Yes, sir. Will the um, so are you still expected to produce seven point six million? Uh, the uh, budget that was passed by this council expected uh, $13 million of revenue from uh, property sales, and this, if appraised value, if, if they receive appraised value uh, in the sale, would be about 5.4. 5.4. Thank you. And then, Chris, thank you. Uh, the $15 million sale of parking meters, which was also included in the one-time sales, how is that going? He's on. I, I'm, I'm trying to think, Councilman. Um, I believe the procurement process is still ongoing. I don't know that an intent to award has been issued at this point. Okay. That's. We the best I've got. Well, should these properties not close or the parking meter sales not close, um, what is finance's strategy for filling the, the budget hole? So I would tell you that right now our strategy is to get this done for as much as we can get. Um, and then we will evaluate what the gap is and look at available alternatives. Okay, thank you. Um, but that, may, but on this, there's a, still a missing 7.6 for the school board, and then on the parking meters, that's not included. And then the other properties, again, just a quick update on this one-time property sales. Um, where are we on the Charlotte parcel and the Green Hills fire station? Has that been listed and are there bids? Councilman, uh, it is currently on e-bid, okay. both properties. Uh, we've got a minimum bid price. Um, we have another week left Okay. in the bid process. We expect the activity to really begin uh, in the last two or three days. Okay. So the, the jury is out on that too. Okay. Jury's out. I, I appreciate it very much. But the only public hearing on this has been at the school board um, in terms of communicating the sort of the public intention. Have we put notices out 
to neighbors, for particularly at Zero Brick Church. I know the neighborhood is feels like it only recently has been aware of that. Um, there's there's not a notification process, so to speak, that when it comes through the school board's process. Uh, notification signs on the property, that sort of thing, are not are not part, part of, of the process. The school board process of surplusing the property. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Councilman Cooper. Councilwoman Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to, to follow up on the question about zero brick church pipe, because I had gotten a, a number of um, emails as well, and, and it um, that particular property um, seems to be adjacent to Parks property, um, and also seems to be on a high range that doesn't seem particularly buildable. Um, so I was wondering if um, it would be appropriate to refer it to the Parks Committee, or if there's someone from Parks here today that can speak to that, to Parks' interest in that property, or? Councilwoman Allen, I don't believe we have anyone here from, from Parks. Can I, can I request that it be referred to the Parks Committee, or? Second. Yes. Okay, <laughs> I'll make that request. And then we'll, we'll ask those questions tomorrow. And then I had another uh, question about 1477, which is the um, 3125 Ironwood Drive, 12 acres. Do we go, does this um, type of property not go through the same process of considering whether it would be appro appropriate for the Barnes Fund, for example, or the Community Land Trust? You wanna come back up, Mr. North? And that, that may be a Mr. Jameson question, I'm not sure. I mean, as we talked about the whole issue of what properties are appropriate for that, is that only the back tax properties that get looked at for, for Barnes Fund? So far. So far. Right. Okay. Um, it just, seem, just seems like 12 acres is, and, and I know, I know you're, you're wishing I would quit asking these questions, but, you know, it, it, from the big picture, the, we struggle with so many things, including fully funding schools, which we all desperately want to do, but also coming up with affordable housing, it's, it's hard to let go of 12 acres. Um, what, was that part of the conversation? That, uh, from the school system's point of view, from the school board, uh, we don't need that property anymore, and so it has been surplused. Um, and what what happens from there is really up, I think, up, up, up to y'all. Now that that is the old Hickman uh, Elementary School, and Councilman Roten may it's in his district. He may want to to speak to that. Yeah. But I'll go to Vice Chair Roten. Okay, and, and, then have, and then I have one more question. Okay, after go that. ahead. Thank you, Councilman Roten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this property right here. I'm, I didn't want to get into it, but I'm going to get into it so we don't have any more discussions on this property. The old Hickman Elementary uh, was built, a new Hickman Elementary was built next to Donaldson Middle School. This property was being used as, I want to call it an alternative school for about 30 students in the middle of a residential neighborhood with about 2,000 homes. Uh, it sits on 12 acres. Um, last year in 2018, we had 146 police calls to this school. Um, I received numerous calls from the police department saying they could not handle the volume of calls they were getting to this school. The number of children that were leaving the facility and entering into people's homes in this residential neighborhood was overwhelming. Uh, the people in this neighborhood deserve better than what they had there. And so what this sale will do is permit them to have in the middle of an area where there's no park and this acreage, I think, could be used for a small development and a good-sized park for an area that really needs that. And that's what we're hoping for here, and that's why I was agreeable to this sale. And I have a feeling it will be purchased at the price that is being asked, and it will be developed and turned into a park. So I hope you all understand why I'm looking forward to selling this piece of property. Thank you, Vice Chair Roden. Councilwoman Allen. Okay, and then, thank you, I appreciate that explanation. That's helpful to understand. On the, on the next one, which I'm, uh, 1015 Davidson Road, which I'm thinking is with the Hillwood School moving, um, we've, been, we've gone through the process of asking that our appraisals have two parts to them. One, what is the land worth today? And two, what is it worth if it gets rezoned? Is that, is that part of the appraisal that, that we're seeing here? And 
is, is there a way that, that Metro schools could get a whole lot, somebody's gonna get a whole lot of money from this. Um, is there a way that Metro schools could benefit from that increase more than just simply selling the land and then letting someone else reap the, the huge benefits of that? Mr. Barry? Yeah, the uh, school says its own procurement process and uh, they commission their own appraisals. Uh, I have read this appraisal, I know the appraiser. Um, the way they look at it, it is they, if it for this particular property, they look at the highest and best use, whatever that zoning may be. Okay, they may discount it slightly uh, because the new buyer would have to go through the rezoning process themselves. But it's, uh, and you can go look at the comps and you can look at uh, the charts that they do and you can tell, take a, and see uh, the value as is and then the value rezone, which we call current and prospective value. Gotcha, and so looking at this, this value of 3.3 .3 million for 9.52 acres, you may not be the right person to ask that. Is that, which, which one of those are we looking at there? That's Davidson Road. Right, and is which, which type of appraisal of the two that you just described? It's highest and best use. Highest and best use, okay. So we feel like the, if, if we give this up, the schools are getting an appropriate amount of funding for it. Okay, I just wanna be sure, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Allen. Councilman Mendez. Let me, let me follow up on that line of question. Um, I, I read it the opposite. I, I read it um, that it's uh, zoned R40 now and uh, it anticipates a change to RM20. Um, and I, I was reading the same way Council Lady Allen was that uh, whoever was gonna buy it um, after the rezone would have more valuable piece of property, not that um, the 3.29 million took into account the zoning change. fundamentally asked a different way it seems like if we just did the like if we're if we're selling off property to make uh, ends meet on a budget um, why wouldn't we just do the rezone ourselves to get the higher price rather than um, uh, it, it's necessarily discounted anybody who buys it from us with the current zoning of r40 is going to have some discount on it because they don't know whether the zoning is going to take place there can't be any possible way the 3.29 reflects um, a certainty of RM20 zoning. I think it's a timing issue on that. I mean, given the goals of schools and as it relates to uh, the budget, um, to go through the rezoning process is, is fairly lengthy. So I would totally agree with that. And this is one of the reasons why selling off property for one-time sales is a ridiculous way to run a railroad. Everybody who's a buyer knows that we're in a hurry to sell this um, and we're gonna get systematically lowballed. And this appraisal makes clear that at R40, it's worth 3.2 million. 3.29 million and immediately somebody will try to get the rezone and if the council member and the planning commission go along with that it's a windfall for whoever buys it because we don't have time to capture the extra value for ourselves um, and I think that's ridiculous um, but um, I just wanted to clarify the way I, I was reading it the way you were reading it, Council Lady Allen um, the follow-up question I, I was going to ask to the other question she asked about um, uh, so how are these properties titled in Metro? As I understand it, all MNPS property is titled in Metro, not in MNPS. As I understand it, uh, legal may want to comment on this, but they're uh, <clears throat> titled in Metro and assigned to schools. Assigned to schools. So um, a thing that I would also agree with Council Lady Allen that we need to figure out, and this goes to, I think, Councilman Glover's point about the um, uh, properties that were going to the community land trust. There's not particularly, I guess I'll ask this as a question, is there any policy procedure, um, guideline, rule of thumb that would tell us what surplus property gets sold off for money and uh, what surplus property would go to the community land trust? Or is it just uh, administration decision? 
That's hard for me to say, but uh, currently it's just been back tax properties. So, the, so, so that's a decision of the administration that to would be limit a decision it. Of the administration, and, correct. And we're happy to give away the fairgrounds as part of a deal and not do affordable housing for other departments' property that are surplus. I mean that that's basically. That's what you're getting at, but it, I mean, I know you're in the hot guy. seat, but the, that, I mean, that's the, uh, in the absence of some other policy, the deal is that back taxes will do for affordable housing and everything else is available for one-time sales or um, other deals. Um, all right, uh, just in, in keeping with, uh, um, I think this is a, a crazy way to run a railroad and I, I can't wait to, um, see what properties are going to get sold this next year to have one-time sales to make the the budget process uh, meet. I'm probably going to be uh, a no on these just just because I, I think this is uh, I, I think there's an open acknowledgement that because of a timing issue, we're going to shortchange ourselves on the value of one of them. Um, so I'm going to be a no. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Mendez. Councilwoman Henderson. Thank you, Council Lady Bircher. Uh, I, I too have concerns about these. I'm glad for purposes of discussion where they're, we're discussing them all at the same time, um, but I would, we, we do when we go to vote on these, finally we need to separate them. Is that correct? I mean, we were gonna take them as, as a collective vote. I, I, yeah. I would move that we not do that, please. We can do that. Because I, I, I wanna support Councilman Roten's uh, Effort, but we, I have we can we can do that, Councilwoman Anderson. Okay, I appreciate that. Regarding, I do have a question about uh, zero Brick Church Pike. Um, I've also been contacted about that and do have some concerns. Um, Mr. North, can you speak to just uh, for your process internal to MNPS, um, uh, not having uh, attended a. a a budget committee discussion. I mean, what are the parameters by which or the the um, criteria that your uh, board makes these uh, determinations to surplus these properties? Like for, you know, Councilman Roten, he's speaking to a very specific problem internal to that neighborhood, a problem property. So, I mean, I see the merit there. Um, but some of these other properties, uh, you know, I think Council Lady Murphy and I passed a resolution speaking to this. Uh, it had some, you know, kind of basically an out of sorts um, for this immediate interim time. But um, I do think this is uh, short short sighted on the part of our city um, to be doing this. But can you speak to how the school board makes this determination? And indeed, if Councilman Cooper was kind of getting there, but you spoke to having. Uh, a, a public platform for citizens like every other meeting, but was there specifically a public hearing about the surplusing of each of these properties at the school board? Uh, there's not a process for a specific public hearing on on various legislation before the school board. The, the process and criteria for surplusing property uh, is generally if the school system doesn't need it currently and doesn't have a foreseeable use for the property. Now, uh, those uh, input uh, comes from operations, comes from student assignment, uh, comes from facilities uh, and other departments uh, within, within the school system. So do you engage uh, now, the planning department at all to look at kind of our development patterns and zoning? So you all might be thinking, oh, I don't think we're going to need this in five years. What about 15 or 20 years from now when we think, oops, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. Oh, we, we need a school in this quadrant now? Uh, yes, ma'am. The student assignment office does contacts all of that and deals with uh, birth rate and deals in planning and checks into all of those when making their projections long term uh, and short term as well. So does uh, school assignment or would each of these properties mm -hmm. then have a companion report that um, uh, validates yep. the, the surplusing. I mean, I guess, is there a staff report of sorts to your school board that they then look at and determine, oh, okay, based on the planning department and school assignment and all these things, this is a good decision? If, if, is there a specific document that I could hand you? I'm not sure there is. I would need to check. I don't, I don't recall exactly the, the 
uh, presentation uh, to the school board. Now, two of those properties, including uh, the one at Zero Brick Church, um, I'm not sure the school system even knew it owned those properties mm -hmm. uh, until we started looking at th this budget year and what properties were out there. Okay. Uh, the, the, those are undeveloped and always have been uh, okay. property. It's not like it's not something that we don't need a school here anymore type of type of question. Okay. Um, if I wanted to see the discussion related to the surplusing of these properties, uh, what uh, what date did that transpire on, and what committee was that, and how would I view that? I would have to get that for you. I don't I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Okay, that'd be good to know. I mean, I would assume it's just the MNPS YouTube channel, but I mean, I don't I, 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 being able to isolate the time frame. And do you all film your committee meetings separately? Are those recorded separately, or are they? They, uh, they are now. I'm not sure they were a uh, a couple of months ago when this was was. Okay, so this was discussed in committee. In, in committee, and, and then before the whole board. That's right. Okay, but there may not be video of the committee that's, discussion. That's correct. Nor is there an actual transparent public document that speaks to the merit of surplusing this property based on certain criteria. I'll have to check to see if there is a document okay. that I would that suggest shows that that would be good from a process and transparency standpoint. Um, okay, I think those are my questions. Richard, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Henderson. Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. First of all, let me say, uh, in Kevin Roten's district, uh, I, I'm, I'm on board. I, I, I know what he's got when I was on the school board. It was a problem. Uh, I'm several years twice removed, and it still obviously is a problem. So I want to support him. The others I, we'll continue talking about. Here's my problem I have because there's two things I've heard that I'm not comfortable with. If these things sell, uh, if, if this happens, Will they be able to accommodate the 13 million or whatever in the shortfall in the school's budget this year? If they feel like they can, if they sell it, l let's assume it happens or whatever property they're going to sell off. If they don't already have things under contract or to sell, let's say it gets under contract March 1st. And I think that's probably aggressive, but if it happened, Realistically, when would actual dollars come to the school board as far as operational money, given the one-time thing we're looking at doing here? Mr. Harmon, would you, um, I, I, mean, I know it's Count contingent upon a lot of things, but I'll, I'll let you answer Sure, that. Councilman, I, I would say to you that uh, that is dependent on the uh, length of the closing procedure. Um, but it point. is expected that the school board had surplus these um, and with consideration of the council um, that we could still achieve these sales um, and realize that revenue in this fiscal year. And are you able to give this council uh, tomorrow, uh, how rapidly the quickest deal we've ever done on a land sale, how quickly it went on the market, it, it was advertised, it was all the various things that happens, it, it sold, we closed it, and we actually put the money in the bank for Metro. Can you give us an idea of what that timeline might look like? Are we looking at 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, or are we looking at greater than that? We would go back and look at the previous property sales and determine uh, what the quickest time frame was. Sure. Okay. So I would like to understand that because I, I find it hard to believe that it, we, we would actually be able to uh, accommodate the, the shortfall for the school system. The other problem I have, and one of the reasons that I, I'm going to support uh, Councilman Roten on this, is because it is a problem. Uh, in, in the McGavitt cluster, which he and I both serve. But we have other things that are happening in, in, in the cluster, 
and you know developers are told we got to give we have to they have to give land they have to do this they have to do that uh, and then if the school board's going to sell it off is there a requirement the school board if we sell this the school board has to utilize that money to build a new school in the same cluster uh, I think I know the answer but is is there any requirement I think it's going to come into the general fund if is my guess unless I'm totally out of bounds here you're correct mm -hmm. so I, I'm going to support Councilman Roden on on his bill the rest of it I think we need to have a lot more conversation so chair I'm not sure how we do this uh, I know you wanted them all put together but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna so we're go. so we're discussing mm -hmm. collectively we'll vote individually all right thank you councilman Davis thank you chair I just was gonna say real quick I, I guess I'm reluctantly supportive because because I know MPS needs the funds and you know that sort of thing I just wanted to reiterate that I don't like the one-time sale practice and if there was a possibility of rezoning I definitely think one we should have been thinking about that but if if there was any window to think about that we should look with the district council member and just see if you can go to RM zoning or something I know it's easier said than done and there could be neighborhood pushback but if that was an opportunity you could exponentially increase the value so it was something that was a great point and again reiterating that we shouldn't be doing these land sales if we don't have to thanks thank you councilman Davis councilman councilwoman Allen Thank you. Picking up on the comment on the district council uh, member, is this in, in council member Wiener's district or is it council member Mina Johnson's? 1015 Davison Road, um, councilwoman Wiener is, is the lead sponsor. She sent the letter for approval. Mr. North. Uh, council Lady Allen, earlier you, you commented about Hillwood and I, I wanted to, to be sure we were clear on where this property was. This okay. is not the Hillwood High School property. This is Bro the former Brookmead ah, Elementary okay. School. Okay, okay. I was envisioning the wrong piece of property. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Allen. Councilwoman Gilmore. Uh, I think Council Member <clears throat> Glover had left. I was just curious to see why um, some council members were supporting some bills and not the others when they're all one-time sale of school properties that's the piece I, I, I just I didn't hear any logic and I, I wanted to hear more logic about that how can you support one but not the other we'll go to uh, councilwoman Anderson I'd be happy to respond to my logic on that um I guess generally um I do not think this is a good way of doing business I don't think in general we should um uh be approaching it like this but that said um you know respectful uh, of the the school board and councilman roten and the particular problem um that that property has um uh presented um you know uh forested hilltop land at brick church pike um that could be part of a park or otherwise you know, I mean, they're they're all different properties, respectfully. So, you know, uh, a former Brookmead Elementary School um, is different. So, I just, in general, um, I don't support this approach. I think, uh, you know, we need to have a real conversation as a city about how we fund our schools. Um, but we can't have that conversation, frankly, because of all the problems. Um, in how we continue to perpetuate um, a certain level of uh, deal making um, and incentives and big projects and uh, you know corruption internal to certain departments. So it's very hard to have a conversation with our citizens about how we need to adjust the tax rate so that we can appropriately fund our schools when we can't otherwise get our house in order in so many other ways. And so I think it is short-sighted of us to continue to sell off property like this. Um, and so uh, that is, Council Lady, uh, why I support one of these, but not all four of them. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Henderson. Uh, Councilman Anthony Davis. Just a quick follow-up, since I found out it was Brooke Mead, I'm, and I'm from Bellevue. Um, that is a <laughs> great site for density. It's on a corner, it's across from Walmart. There's an explosion of density at Nashville West, which I'm at too often as I'm on my way to 
out to Bellevue. So I, I just know now that it is a great site for more density. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Davis. Vice Chair Roten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Real quick, just to make sure everybody's clear on my piece of property. We have had meetings, me, the state rep, the school board representative, and Metro Nashville Public Schools for at least two and a half years about what are we going to do with this, with these 30 students and this school. And they came to a realization that this property was not working. The contract is up March the 1st. So that school will no longer be active because of what's happened at that school. It's moving over to Foster Avenue and uh, Councilman Sledge's district, he's comfortable with that. They're working on a plan to make sure that everyone's comfortable. This neighborhood is just, it wasn't the appropriate place for this. The building was built in the 19, early 50s, I believe. It's got some serious problems. And so this is a really good piece of property to sell in the middle of a residential area. It's RS10. I think we can go a little denser than that so we can actually do a park there as well. It's just a good chance to sell this property. So I think this one, I think I'd, this had been brought up and I think the administration heard from me and Metro School Board heard from me and they said, you know, this will be a good one to sell because it's all come together. It really needs to be sold. So that's where we are on that one. Thank you, Vice Chair Roten. Uh, Councilman Cooper. Thank you, Chair. Uh, very quickly, and uh, just a quick thing for Chris to add to his list before tomorrow, if he didn't mind. Uh, before we get to the council session tomorrow, an update on where we are in FY19 of expenses under projection and revenues over projection so that we can assess the, the budget hole. And I think that'd be very constructive for people to have that prior to having these, these votes on one-time property sales. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Cooper. Uh, Councilman Glover. I'm not going to back off the fact I believe it needs to be sold. I, th I think uh, Councilman Roten is exactly right. I just want to make sure I understand. If this is sold, if there is a developer who's willing to buy it, et cetera, I want to make sure, is this going to go towards the $13 million deficit, or what exactly is this money going to be used for? Mr. Harmon. Yes, Councilman. The proceeds from the sale of the property would be credited toward the $13 million, uh, in revenue uh, that was budgeted for schools. All right. So, Madam Chair, if you wouldn't mind, I would, I would appreciate the board indulging me. We have $13 million. We're, we have a shortfall, uh, and it depends on selling property of which whatever it, you're able to get out of your district. Uh, we're obviously, I, well, I'm not going to say obviously. But we also have gone into their reserve funds, et cetera. We didn't do raises. Is there a possibility that we can get something from Mr. North, not by tomorrow, certainly, but over the next uh, week or so to kind of give us an idea of uh, when the budget rolls out to us, and I think we're getting close to that, uh, when the budget does roll out to us, can we uh, meet with the board to, to try and determine where money is, what we think is going to happen, et cetera? Because if we're, if we're $13 million short right now uh, on, on selling a piece of property or pieces of property, it's only going to get worse as we go forward. So I, I'm just trying to figure out how we do this because I'm, I'm going to have to agree uh, with every other council member here. One-time sales is a bad, bad move. Uh, so I, I think we just need to walk into this thing with our eyes wide open. And I don't know how you want to do that, Chair, but I really think it would be beneficial for us. We'll Thank let you. Mr. Mark coordinate um, the dates, work with council staff so we can coordinate um, both committees, Budget and Finance and edu the Education Committee. Um, I believe uh, the board did have their budget retreat this past weekend. And am I correct that they discussed the budget this past? They did. Okay. And the, the budget will will be presented by the by the school administration to the school board budget committee initially uh march the 5th okay uh, and then uh the schedule is for uh the school board to vote uh, on a budget april 9th okay thank you mr north uh one second councilman uh woman gilmore councilman sledge Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for recognizing me. I know I'm not on the committee. This will probably be the most you are not. comment <laughs> that you'll have. Um, but it follows up on what Council Lady Allen was saying. The parcel numbers match up on this, 
but there is a Davidson Drive and a Davidson Road that are right next to each other in this neighborhood. And I believe this is supposed to be Davidson Drive, but it is listed on the I believe we had corrected Davidson that. Didn't we Road. correct that, Mr. Harmon? Didn't we have correct? Give us one second, Councilman Sledge. Sure. I thought that we had corrected that from where it was an issue. Councilman Sledge, I'm, I have a copy of the ordinance in front of me that says 1015 Davidson Drive with the map and parcel number matching what is in your abstract in the agenda, but I, I can't speak to why the agenda says Davidson Road. And, and that's what the ordinance says when we pull it up on our screens as well, it says Davidson Road. So I'm sure we can get this figured out. I just don't, given that it seems like this might be a little urgent, I don't want little hiccups like this to potentially become big hiccups later. So I don't have the ordinance in front of me, I'm just reading off the, the agenda. A drive. Which is correct? Is it road or drive? Road is on the latest version. We'll check it and get a substitute if necessary by tomorrow. Okay. We'll, um, Mr. Jamison, we'll research it and if, if we need a substitute, we can do that tomorrow. Thank you, Councilman Sledge. Councilwoman Henderson. Uh, thank you, Chair Lady Vircher. I just want to make a, a general request as it relates to these uh, uh, property uh, surplus uh, surplusing ordinances. Um, I think uh, these captions for these bills are not sufficiently explanatory or transparent. Um, I think it should be clear that it is school property, um, and you know whether it is, you know, what is the body that is surplusing this. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of this and sometimes it's, you know, teeny little small scraps of land, you know, for purposes of stormwater or this or that. And it absolutely is incumbent upon us to, you know, read the backup information and as a committee we do. But I'm just saying, you know, from the community's standpoint, I think it is important from a process improvement standpoint, Chair Lady, as it relates to budget and finance, that we make sure these uh, surplus properties um, have a more uh, detailed caption, please. I'll work with council staff regarding that, Councilwoman Henderson. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further discussion, now we will take um, the individual votes on um, these respective properties. So we'll begin with BL 2019-1476. This is the, the surplus of Zero Brick Church Pike. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, we're gonna need a show of hands. All in favor? Two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. I'm six. Six. Opposed? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six to six, no recommendation. Okay, six to six, no recommendation. Now we're on BL 2019-1477. Um, this is uh, sponsors, Roten, Virtue, and others. This is the surplus of 3125 Ironwood Drive. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Uh, you're gonna press your microphone, Councilwoman Henderson. Thank you, Chair Lady. This was just a point of order, I apologize. I had um, confused in my notes. Um, the property that Councilman uh, Roten was supporting and discussing is indeed Ironwood Drive, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. We are on, we're voting on BL 2019-1477. This is the property located in Vice Chair Roten's uh, district. All in favor? Opposed? Bill will be recommended. 
Now we're on BL 2019-1478. This is in Councilwoman Wiener's district. We do have a letter to approve from her. This is uh, 1015 Davison Road. We're gonna research to make sure it's, it's not road versus drive. And if necessary, we'll offer a substitute tomorrow. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, we're gonna need show of hands. All in favor? Opposed? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Fails. It fails? Yeah. yeah. Uh, recommendation fails. Motion fails. Yes, Councilwoman Allen. Do we need to vote on the recommendation for the Parks Committee to look at 1476, or is that, that's done? Okay, thank yeah. you. We already noted that, uh, Councilwoman Allen. Um, now we're on BL 2019-1479, sponsors Syracuse, Virtue, and others. This is the surplus of 2795 Pennington Bend Road. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, we're gonna need a show of hands. All in favor? Eight. Opposed? Okay, bill will be recommended. Okay, almost committee, almost. Now we're on BL 2019-1480, sponsors Van Rees, Virtue, and others. Authorizes the acquisition of right-of-way easements, drainage easements, temporary construction easements, and property rights from Madison Station Boulevard. Is there a motion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no discussion, all in favor? Opposed? Bill is recommended. BL 2019-1485, sponsors Virtual O'Connell and Bettany, approves a form master participation agreement to be used by the Metro Department of Water and Sewage Services to enter into agreements with developers for the recuperation of costs associated with the Southeast Development Area and authorizes Metro government to execute the agreement. Is there a motion? motion. It's been moved and properly seconded. We have some discussion. Councilwoman Henderson. Thank you, Councilor Virtual. Can someone from Water please uh, speak to this? We'll have Mr. Snyder come up. Jim Snyder, Metro Water. Hello, Mr. Snyder. Can you just provide us a summary about the Southeast Development Area, what that is, where particularly this is, and just the nature of this um, uh, agreement, please? Yes, ma'am. And I will try to do this as efficiently as I possibly can. Um, so this is the Southeast Quadrant of the County. Um, the boundary is uh, to the east, uh, 24, on the north, uh, Bell Road, on the west, um, Nolensville, and then to the south, um, Battle, Kid Road. Those are, that's kind of that general area. It's, but it's in the southeast part of the county. I can tell you that this area um, was serviced by the Radnor Utility District, and Metro adopted this back in the mid-70s, early 70s. And these lines were built uh, with re just residential in mind. Um, and so I can tell you that the system that's there, the pipes are in good shape. It's just that they're uh, undersized for the, the unprecedented growth that we're seeing in the southeast uh, quadrant. And so uh, the good thing about this, this is 100% funded by developers. And so what we are asking uh, the council to do is to approve a master participation agreement that we can use um, and the sign off on that would be the director of our department, uh, Mr. Potter, and uh, the Metro attorney. And so uh, I can tell you that we would build this, if you have those little layouts, we would build this uh, in section, this, these improvements in five different phases. Uh, the good thing about this is, is that we will control the construction so that you don't have a, a mass number of developers in the area trying to build trying to build these lines, but they, but they will pay for it. I can also tell you that on phase one, the, the cost of phase one is about $5 million, and uh, we already have lined up uh, developers waiting on this legislation 
uh, about $8.5 million. So it will pay for phase one, and it will get started in phase two, and we won't go to phase two until we, to to we get that funding in place. The point is, it's fair to the ratepayers, it's fair to the city, and the developers, the developers support it. So I appreciate that. So basically a participation agreement that includes this broader development area, which uh, would be how many acres, roughly? Well, I don't have, I mean, I don't necessarily have the acreage. Uh, obviously, we can go, go GIS and get the acreage. Can but, you just but, speculate? I won't hold you to it, but yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, what size of area are we talking about? Here? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm also a licensed land surveyor, <laughs> and I can usually look at a piece of property and tell how much it is. This is going to be thousands of acres, okay. I, but I don't know exactly what that number is. We can get that for you. But what this legislation does do, it, it, it protects because it, we set the border on which parcels are involved in this legislation. It ties it to that, and it ties it to a dollar amount. And so uh, we will use this legislation, once again, to build those five phases, and once they get built, uh, we're done. And it is, it does identify which parcels this applies. Uh, so it does provide some level of accountability and protection as to uh, what the legislation does. And can I ask just uh, as it relates to this developer um, particularly, um, they are, are they mentioned by name here in this agreement? Uh, they are not. Um, but it, I, Who is this developer? Well, there's, well multiple. I said there's multiple developers. There's probably more to come. Okay. And that's the, that's the point. Uh, I can tell you that, Councilor, the, these improvements, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little math here. You see in the legislation that it's $1,000 per unit of water. And so one unit of water is 350 gallons per day, which is basically what a household would use. And so these improvements would add 23,000 units of water to this area. And so we feel like, and we coordinate with planning, we know what the, what the zonings are, uh, and so we feel that putting this in place will serve this area for many, many years. So I appreciate that. So really large-scale development, multiple developers involved, y'all are being proactive, uh, delivering good infrastructure, and again, the developers are paying 100% of that? Yes, ma'am. Great. That is a great participation agreement. Appreciate yes, ma'am. Councilwoman Dow. Thank you. I would like to know a little bit more about this because this does impact the district that I serve and I'm really shocked that I was not made aware of this. Um, so um, I would like to defer this until we can sit down and have a conversation so I can learn more about it. I think one of the issues that, first of all, I think they did this without my knowledge on purpose. Um, and that's the first thing. Uh, because uh, most of the water projects that occur out in our district or any kind of participation agreement, uh, usually I'm consulted. So I'm really disappointed that I was not consulted on this. And I don't know if my other Southeast colleagues were consulted about this particular participation agreement or not. And I think the reality is, is what we need to talk about here is that our area has been so overdeveloped that we're having issues. We don't have water. And that's what they're not telling you. And when we sit here and planning, and we agree to put thousands and thousands of apartments and they overcrowd our schools to the point where we're selling land just to finance a space. And children don't have books in their classroom. We don't have water and water pressure. This is the result of it. So now we don't have any water out there. So this participation agreement is a way of getting the developers to put in some pumping stations, I'm assuming, because that's what they need to accommodate more water, to accommodate more apartments out in our area that's already overdeveloped. I think what needs to happen is we need to sit down and have a conversation with me, the council person, and other leaders out in this area to understand what you're attempting to do before we move forward. So I ask respectfully that we defer this until they can have a conversation with me until we understand what we're doing here. Make the Thank motion. You. I make a motion that we defer this uh, to meetings so that we have an opportunity to sit down and talk with our leadership to know what this participation agreement is about. It's been moved for, there's a motion for deferral. Can I get a second? It's been moved and properly seconded. All in favor? Opposed? This bill is uh, deferred. Before we adjourn, I just want to say thank you. We had a heavy uh, agenda tonight. I also want to encourage you, we have another committee meeting after this meeting, so I want to encourage as many uh, members if you can stay for this next committee meeting, because um, we, we're, we're almost four hours in, so um, we are adjourned. <laughs>